Welcome, brother. <laughs> <laughs> David, how you been? Yeah, been, been staying on, been staying alive, man. You, know? been you trying gotta do to, what you gotta yeah. do. Huh? <laughs> been just trying to. It's been a crazy couple of years, but uh, yeah. luckily, uh, can't complain. Yeah, I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. I feel like I haven't seen you, but then at the same time, I also blur out the pandemic year. So in yeah. my mind, I'm like, oh, I saw Zeke like six months ago. Yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. but I'm like, no, actually, that might have been more like a year and six months ago. Like, yeah, it's weird. But um, like I've known some people yeah. um, since pandemic. Yeah. And I feel like I've known them for a long time. Yeah. But then I realized, oh, I've known you for a year and a half. <laughs> and it's I've, I've only yeah. known you during the pandemic. Yeah. Which is really weird. Yeah. But let's talk about cool things. I had the <laughs> Peruvian food recently. Oh, Peruvian food. It was Where? amazing. Where? Uh, in Williamsburg. I forget the place. It's like kind of expensive, kind of nice. Uh, I think On I... uh, uh, Meeker. Meeker. Oh, I'm my God. Sure. Yeah. It was I know. Phenomenal. I know I've heard of a spot around there, but... Uh, it's yeah. really, really good. I mean, Peruvian cuisine is a... It's definitely not like a mom and pop shop. It's yeah, like no. a little <laughs> yeah. fancy. Yeah. But it's, it's really excellent. Yeah, From the not... service... To the food for to presentation, it's like phenomenal. Yeah. Well, what did what do you have? Well, I wish I could remember. <laughs> <laughs> I still. I, it was a lot of cool things. You yeah. know, very fancy names. I didn't. Well, the last thing that we had for like we shared a lot of stuff. Yeah. But the last thing had uh like French fries, a lot mm. of it. But it's like part of it. I'm yeah. like French fries. Salchi, papa, salomo saltado. Maybe yes, yeah. I think so. Jesus, that thing is incredible. Yeah, lomo saltado. I mean, proving cuisine is so diverse, and you know, really, yeah. it's like. I, that's what I love about Peruvian cuisine. There's the, such an the place we went to once together, like a small shop on uh, what is it, like in Sunset Park. Was that Peruvian or no? It was definitely mm-hmm. like Latin or was it Mexican? I don't remember. It might have been Mexican. Yeah, uh, yeah. After like a Brooklyn College reunion thing at in yeah, Industry they City. Yeah, went to Tacos El Bronco. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a Mexican spot, but mm. there's also a Peruvian spot around there that has a really good ceviche. But that's the only thing that's good there. Okay. <laughs> everything yeah. else, yeah, everything else. Nice. Yeah. At this point, I've had it yeah. three times. It's really yeah, nice. Yeah, ceviche is really nice. No, but I, I love Peruvian cuisine, man. It's just so diverse. Three really diverse amount of flavors from mm-hmm. fish and beef dishes, uh, chicken dishes, vegetarian dishes. What do you guys drink? What's the drink? Over there? Uh, well, the traditional traditional drink is chicha morada, mm-hmm. which is like a purple maize drink. So it's like just like purple corn. And you you put water, you dip the purple corn in there, you leave it there for a while. You put cinnamon, mm-hmm. a whole bunch of stuff, and then you obviously take out the corn. And then it's like a, I don't know how to describe it. I guess it's like, it's nothing like horchata, Mexican horchata, mm-hmm. but it's in a world, I guess, like, mm-hmm. um, of that. But it's a it's a delicious drink. Uh, wow. That's the most common drink. And of course the. The soda is Inca Cola. I'm not sure oh, if you've seen the yellow. I, yeah, yeah. I never tried it. It's a, it tastes like bubblegum, probably. Mm. Yeah, it's um, but it's an immense cream soda ish or no? You know, I've never actually had cream soda, oh, so I, loser, I don't man. know. Yeah, I've not, that's my favorite thing yeah, in America, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I've ever tried cream soda. That's the only reason I stayed in America, bro. <laughs> like for cream yeah. soda, it's like <laughs> mind boggling. But uh, yeah, it's actually such a popular drink in Peru. But um, I, there was this big thing where years ago, um, Coke like try to like establish like an ad war mm. against Inca Cola. I forget if it was Coke or Pepsi. But um basically they tried to like establish like this ad where they were like, okay, we want to take over the Peruvian soda market that Inca Cola runs. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're gonna try to do our best to push our drink. And so they p- put tons of money into the advertising. Like they had people at like the convenience stores wow. with like I forget, I think it was Pepsi, but it was like with like Pepsi suits, like, you know, they had all these things trying to get people to buy Pepsi. And ultimately, it's just they couldn't take the market from Inca Cola. Inca Cola was like, it's just like the number one drink in Peru. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, That's another interesting thing. You mentioned Pepsi. I feel like, uh, like in America, like there's kind of this unspoken thing where people uh, judge you if you like Pepsi more. (laughs) Like I've yeah. been noticing yeah. that everybody's like, you like what Pepsi more? Oh, what's yeah. wrong with you? Like, well, th- that's the thing. No one, I don't know if it's like advertising play in my head as well, but like, no, in my mind, who likes Pepsi more? So like, here's the thing. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, so I was gonna like talk to you about this back home, uh, and I hundred percent think like marketing works. Yeah, and I was talking to these yeah. people. They're like, "Oh, Coca Cola." They associated like Christmas with Coca Cola. Like yeah. that's like been ingrained. Those images yeah, no, of this Santa, Santa, yeah. Santa uh, you know, and. It's just been so ingrained where people feel cozy with exactly. Coke. Yeah. 
back home, there was this period of time from like early 2000s, like mid 2000s, where Pepsi had all the soccer um, kind of gifts, uh, like little, uh, not lotteries, but like, uh, like you can win certain uh, items if you buy Co- uh, Pepsi. Hmm. So you, you yeah. open a little cap and on the other side of the cap, it would be like a jersey or like a little yeah. cup or whatever, like a bowl. And so we all were buying Pepsi hmm. and it was all associated with soccer for us. And we yeah. were just obsessed. So yeah. there was that period of time for like five, six years. Everybody was just drinking Pepsi because it hmm. always had every summer, every season. They would have some sort of like yeah. Beckham yeah, on, yeah, on, so. on, on it or like on the cover or something. Yeah. So I actually like Pepsi more. So oh, and it wow, stayed yeah. with me forever. Like yeah. my choice over Coke is Pepsi. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So it's like, it, but it's so logical and because like if Pepsi pushed, uh, if Pepsi ultimately where you came from controlled the market, then of course in your mind you're like Pepsi's the best. Why? Why yeah. would it? Yeah. And you you keep that with you. I mean, that's also like interestingly enough the testament to how powerful marketing is. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> that you probably forever. I mean, I don't know, but you probably to some degree because of your a certain part in your life. Pepsi was like the number one drink. You, in your head, you're like, yeah. oh, Pepsi is better. Like, are yeah. you kidding me? Like, <laughs> exactly. And obviously, here in America, I mean, Coca Cola definitely runs the the market as far as I think. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how like you would think that uh, they don't have to make one more commercial ever, right? They don't <laughs> yeah, need no, to do anything yeah. ever. You would People think, still yeah. gonna just buy it, but you have insane amount of money still spent on marketing. Yeah, you know, on all these companies. No, totally. Uh, I gotta ask you, how you feel about Messi leaving Barcelona? <laughs> We gotta talk yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, it's uh, it's interesting that it's uh, it finally happened, right? It finally happened. Yeah. It, but it, it happened in such a weird way. No, I mean, it's like I, everyone knew about this market cap situation, and so what? Uh, yeah. What happened exactly? I haven't been following uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, I remember last year he almost left. Yeah, and he almost left well, to Inter, the, when the, I was really excited about. Yeah, what was the 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 bureau fax, uh, drama where you know he was a bureau fax was sent and right it stated that Messi was unhappy with things that we were things. Obviously, it was a tough season and for Barcelona, and I think he, I think Messi ultimately is a very emotional player, and I think losing the Champions League in this in that specific way was very crushing for him, and I think he just felt. I mean, I don't know. I think he acted out and he was just like, you know, I'm not happy. Things need to change. But with this one, what was weird about it is that um, I truly believe it, it ultimately Barcelona wanted to let him go. I think mm-hmm. since the original drama, they were thinking like, OK, maybe in the long term, it's in our interest to lose Messi now because we are going to lose Messi eventually. Like We've had 10 years of outside of like the game and winning and whatever. The business of Barcelona. Yeah. Messi has been incredibly profitable for their com- for their company. For the past 10 years. But I think they were starting to realize that, all right, it's 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 approaching the end anyways. He's going to leave the club. Like, he's going to retire anyway. So I think they decided to let him go. Did they sell him or no? No. So he left as a free agent. So the deal was uh, Barcelona bought a bunch of players. They bought like Aguero. They spent, I forgot who else. They bought a couple other players. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, they uh, they infringed upon the, the salary cap that La Liga has on clubs. So basically... Barcelona cannot pay their club, their their players more than a certain amount, according to the Liga's rules. Mm-hmm. But this wasn't like, it didn't come out of nowhere. This is like, this is, everyone knows this. And it, I think it occurred to people like a few months ago with the Aguero signing and stuff that Barcelona can't actually afford to keep all these players on the payroll. Mm. Like, so the question is, why were they, why'd they get Aguero if they couldn't, they couldn't even put him in the club? How did they buy Why did they buy him? Because as the new season started, he, in theory, he wouldn't be able to play. Or or someone had to go. Messi had to go. Or Griezmann had to go. But basically, yeah. they couldn't pay these players this much. But And so people were like, is this just mismanagement? It, it seems silly to think, though, that, I mean, of course, there's accountants there. Like, you know, they, right, right, they right. knew. They had to know. Um, but basically, it got to a point where they were trying to sell players. And the question became, Messi's salary is so high that he might just there's it's it became apparent that they couldn't sell enough players to afford to have Messi there and for this reason they said that Messi had to go because we cannot afford to pay him but i mean if you really look at it i think that's silly i think they knew very well that 
yeah. think they had to have a reason to give the people that they didn't, they're not bringing. But I think ultimately they wanted to push Messi out since the whole issue that happened last year. And this was the way they ultimately decided to do it. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously everyone saw that video of Messi crying and crying yeah. in the interview. You know, I mean, I, everyone, it's, it was, a, it was surprising how emotional a moment it is. And you know, obviously Messi's always been the superstar, but I, and it really occurred to me when he won the Copa America that there is something about Messi that people see as sincere or something that because people like my mom cried during watching the interview of Messi. Like my dad was like very, I was like moved. It's like, wow, something about Messi really seems to like, yeah, this is like a sad moment. When we won the Copa America and he was, you know, like celebrating and crying, like, you know, about winning it. Everyone seemed to be, I talked to was like, dude, yeah, we're just happy that Messi won. Brazilians that I spoke to who lost that game, they were like, Oh yeah, it sucks the Argentina one, but yeah, it's it's good to see Messi win though. So it's like everyone seemed to be behind Messi and like wanted him to win and want to, and then this happened and I don't know, it's uh it's Messi even Messi saying that he would have taken half the salary or a quarter right, salary. Right. He he that. told he's like I would have gone lower for them. But and then that's what makes it apparent that they just didn't want him anymore. Mm-hmm. They decided that we're going to lose him eventually. Um you know, obviously Messi's not in the best point of his career anymore. Like I don't think anyone can say that. So it's like, yeah, it's now it's time to maybe look to the future and look forward to a club without Messi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how did the uh, uh, the fans respond? I mean, I understand that you're a fan, you cried and stuff, but yeah. overall, what's their kind of statement? Do you know? Uh, I mean, everyone's, I think, ultimately, the attachment to Messi is strong, I think. Very sad to see Messi go. But interestingly enough, from the people I've talked to, they're Barcelona fans. They seem to be on the, oh, but we think this might have been the right decision overall. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting as well. Like, yes, you're yeah. very sad that Messi left, but they're like, but it makes maybe sense for Barcelona mm-hmm. for Messi to leave. Of course, you don't want Messi to leave like this, maybe. It's like, yeah. it would have been nice for him to play the final game there and everything, you know, and like, just have a proper send off or something. But Yeah, that didn't happen. No, that didn't happen. That's exactly. crazy. Yeah. If you ever see how uh, Javier Zanetti leaves and the send off they give him, it's like emotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totti, like a lot yeah. of like guys, like legends. Yeah. And I'm like shocked that Messi didn't have like a proper send off. Yeah. That sounds like no, it has to be the send off, the best ever. Yeah, no, you of course. You would, of course. They I mean, would call like a stadium yeah. after him. You know it what I mean? They would rename new, new yeah. come okay. to <laughs> Messi. Yeah, no, of like, course. That's what I thought would happen. Yeah, no, but it's interesting that it didn't happen that way. And it's more like, again, like the fans I've talked, they're like, you know, maybe it's a good thing that Messi leaves. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, Barcelona in the recent years has gone through tons of issues as far as their club management and their presidential scandal. I mean, Barcelona, the club is yeah, that's it's kind of a mess right now, honestly. But um, yeah, no. Well, I think everyone's sad that Messi left and maybe a bit angry that he left in this method, this way. But mm-hmm. I don't. I think most people are like, maybe this is you know probably the right decision. It's yeah. interesting, like everything you say, like uh, like Messi has always been very like symbolic figure. Yeah, you know, he was always kind of compared to like God, right? Like yeah. child's, uh, like a God's child. Exactly. Yeah. And the uh, um, and you know, his kind of nemesis <laughs> is uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. Which uh, like, and that's uh, like Messi makes people cry. Yeah. Because he's like such a symbolic figure. Exactly. Right. It was like a spiritual, right? Yeah. God and very like spirituality. Yeah. And they were like Cristiano Ronaldo kind of been realizing he's more of like a very human excellence of an athlete and discipline, yeah. right? And that's yeah. kind of you respect him for that. Yeah. He looks like that too. Like yeah. Messi doesn't look this imposing big guy who's gonna just no, he just has this insane uh, yeah. talent. He's like a, a superhero, yeah. you know, who is like looks like average boy yeah, that but that's what people i think are more attracted to messi overall it's like he messi definitely i think the latino americans particularly like you know this messi is ultimately he kind of if you saw him on the street he's like a guy i mean now he looks but early on in his career if you saw him on the street you wouldn't necessarily think he's a soccer right. player even you'd be like oh yeah. this is just a normal guy yeah. like he doesn't and i think him just obviously going into the field and doing these amazing things he felt more like a common person i think yeah and he and even now, it still feels closer to like a con person. Well, Ronaldo was always like, I mean, if you see Ronaldo on the street, you're like, oh, this guy's like a superstar. You could yeah, tell him walking exactly. around, like he's yeah. a superstar. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, he's more into like the moments you remember of Ronaldo. He's the recent one with water. Yeah, you, you remember where he was like aqua, like drink water. Oh yeah, like there was yeah, Coca Cola yeah, yeah. in front of him. Like that's the yeah. sc- that's the stories you remember from him. Or 
There was one where Pat- Patrice Yevra, I don't know if I'm butchering Patrice Evra, Evra yeah, right? Evra, yeah. The French guy. Yeah. The, I mean, he was one of like top yeah, five, United. Uh, you know, left backs yeah. like in the world in the time, yeah, you know? Yeah. And uh, he tells a story of Ronaldo. I don't know if you've ever heard um, where he's like, if he ever invites you home, never go because <laughs> you guys going to play soccer. You're going to yeah, yeah, yeah. do swimming. You're going to run yeah. uh, uh, laps. <laughs> You're going to yeah. drink water only. Yeah. You're going to ha- eat very healthy. You're going to have a little exactly. workout. Like that's his like dinner hangout night. Inter- yeah. Like Because he's all about that. No, and he's it, like 35 now and he still plays, you know, at the high level. No, of course. But it, it's interesting that uh, most of the people I would talk to probably don't like Ronaldo for that reason. It's like, I don't know, even though you could say, yeah, he's the pinnacle of discipline. He's like, yeah. uh, obviously, practically superhuman, spe- like ability, physical ability. But he's also incredibly disciplined clearly yeah. you know for him to maintain i mean i i'm not like as biased i don't yeah. care but i like them both yeah i love you know messi i mean how if you're a fan of a sport like yeah. how can you not enjoy watching you know him at his tip of his career like yeah. there's still sometimes i in my recommendation on youtube there's some goals of messi that i haven't seen like yeah. i feel like i've seen everything but yeah. then they surprise me every every time yeah, but th- it's interesting. But, I think mm-hmm. this quality that Messi has, and I think this is, again, why I- I'm drawn to him. And I think a lot of people I know are drawn to him. It's like this weird, like, he just, when he plays soccer, again, there's something, I don't know, I can't think of the right word for it. It's um kind of like this, it's like he's embodying, like, it's magical like a like a thing he's it's it's really like magical it's like enjoyable he's embodying something that like you would see maybe on a street game except to the highest level like he's just he scores these goals effortlessly but he does it in a way that it just you know he's a short guy and he's just doing these things which is i think when you see ronaldo obviously the superstar tall specimen who who also scores in a different way even than messi yeah i think for some reason it's just a lot of people I think like the whole package is why they hold a bias against him. And yeah, but like it, it is a little confusing. I, I get yeah. what you're saying, and I don't understand why wouldn't you, why would you put them against each other, you know, exactly, and not yeah. kind of like like them in a parallel because yeah. Ronaldo doesn't he's not Balotelli, yeah. you know, that boat that says I have a lot of money, I'm yeah, the, exactly. I'm the cool guy. Like he's not. He's opposite of that actually. He's complete opposite yeah. of Balotelli. He's yeah. all about you know that's what you should do. Like everybody should everybody can do this. I'm not, you know, I am the best in the world, yeah. but you should be too. That's the kind of vibe I get from yeah, him. He's no, not totally. like conceited or or even if he is a little bit like good for like he should be. Like yeah. how can you <laughs> stay not, you know, uh like all there for yeah. so many years? We've only seen I don't think we've seen people like soccer players who've been at that level no. for lo- for that amount of no, time. I mean, honestly, right now I think we have some of the oldest soccer players that I goes to show you, I think the advancement in maybe the science of fitness but still yeah we have older soccer players than i think at least I, that appears to me that yeah like messi's 34 now right? yeah 33 34. i mean yeah still he's performing amazingly suarez is i believe 34 35 Sometimes maybe that, yeah, yeah and still obviously performing it's like there are these players this is like 35 in soccer is old like considered yeah. really old even like yeah. unless you're in the serie a <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like I guess. old guys just like yeah. keep going yeah and, you know <laughs> Qualiarella, I think, starting a new season now. You yeah. know, he was like fucking forty already, probably. Yeah, no. I don't know how old he is, but well, how old is Buffon now? 40, he's forty. He's forty-one, 40 something, forty-two, yeah. or something. Yeah, he's definitely out there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, well, it, Serie A is known for that. Like, yeah. they're not like the fastest guys. They're very tactical, very yeah. defensive, right? So you like big, tough guys like Chiellini. Like they still yeah. play. For, you know, all these guys, Maldini. They, like the very defensive. Kind of slow, but very tactical. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, uh, and the same with the with the offense. You have mm. a, like a classic Italian, you know, guys. They're just kind of more of a, um, what do you call it? like target men, right? Mm. Uh, kind of st- uh, strikers. Yeah. Uh, like Luca Toni, I think his last uh, season, he was like top scorer. Yeah. Like suddenly he was just yeah scored like. 30 something goals like yeah. it's just something that happened and he was like 39 or something yeah, yeah. or 38 and and it's it wasn't like uh, you had a very good player still at, at that time in yeah. in Serie A it's not like there was no other you know uh, top guys yeah sure um yeah and the same with Qualarelli he was top scorer like two years ago which is and scored one of one of the best goals of his career like being like in 35 that's it, it is interesting how like all these different um championships 
kind of have their like very dedicated style. And sometimes you even see the refs would you know you would say like oh in Serie A that would be, that wouldn't be a foul and like yeah, in Spain no. that would be. Totally. What do you think of Euro? Euro? You know, I, I'll be honest. Uh, I watched the final on a plane. Uh, I didn't watch much of the Euro. Uh, I was probably more concerned with the Copa America, but oh, uh, yeah, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I mean, both tournaments were kind of crazy overall. Yeah. Like this was, I mean, probably I, it was one of the most interesting Copa Americas, and yeah. I think the Euro on the same side, the Euro was probably one of the most interesting yeah. Euros, and yeah, I've seen in a while. There was a lot of drama. It still end up the finals are kind of predictable, yeah. you could say, but I mean, not the as way the yeah. way there, the way to to the finals was kind of yeah. rocky and surprising. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, I thought you know you would think France. Was it, France. Was it I, 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 was, I was hoping Belgium would show something. Yeah, finally. No, yeah. I'm shocked that Belgium hasn't gotten anything in last like uh, ten years. Well, because it's sad. Had the, yeah, they have the like a golden generation. Golden generation. Yeah, they have a golden generation it's of players. Incredible. Right now. Yeah, their their team is incredible, and I'm just shocked. It's like uh, they're gonna experience what like Czech Republic experienced in like yeah. mid 2000s. Totally. When Nedved and all those crazy Bodrush and yeah. Um, Crazy team. They yeah, had a yeah. very, you know, uh, a lot of good guys. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a shame because, like, if you don't win the World Cup or win a tournament, it's like you don't remember them. Yeah, you, that's you, the people crazy forget thing. them. Like they're like, exactly. oh, you know, people forget that there was this generation exactly. unless you win something. Yeah, when I, people ask me, is Croatia? Croatia is a good team. I'm like, yeah, right now. Yeah, like yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they're gonna do it tomorrow, but yeah. uh, definitely had another also golden generation. They've yeah, done, no, like, they did. I would say for the last World Cup, difficult not to remember them. But uh, but Italians, I was very impressed with Italian team this uh, year because um, it was the right team for the right moment. Yeah, it wasn't the best team in the world. No, it yeah, was just definitely. kind of a team of the moment, and I think and I like that about like Euro or World Cup. I think that's the most interesting way. Like every World Cup, when you see you saw Spain for uh, eight years. It, it was the same team playing yeah. every Euro ever World Cup. I'm talking from like 2006 yeah, yeah, yeah. to like totally. 2014, you know. It's like, okay, cool. But um, I'm kind of like over, like, it's not as interesting to me. Yeah, anymore. totally. I like one like fresh blood, new yeah. guys. Like, it was very interesting yeah. Italian team. I, I don't know the Italian team very well, but I'm understanding that they were very young players also. A lot like, of young players. Very young players, yeah. very newer players. And yeah. they, uh, yeah, I mean, they won a major major yeah. tournament. Like yeah. it, was, it was very impressive. But there was a good, quite a good uh, uh, balance, I think, between yeah. old. There was really old guys yeah. like fucking Chiellini and yeah. uh, Bonucci and, you know. Uh, and then you got really young guys like Chiesa and Barella and uh, yeah. Bastoni one. Chiesa, yeah, Chiesa I remember his yeah, 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 no, there was, there was some... It's going to be an interesting future in football. You it's know? funny. I was watching Chiesa since he was in Fiorentina before, yeah. and there was even talk him joining Inter, and I was like, yeah. oh, hopefully yeah. that he, he picked Juventus. Yeah. But we got Barella. Barella was yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. key guy in the mid- midfield. He's like a classic regista style, so he yeah. like goes from the you know the deep. And one of the best uh, players in Inter now, they're trying to make him like into captain and stuff. So. Yeah. No, but Inter, I don't know if you've heard what's happening in Inter. No, I haven't. Like, I haven't heard so, much. So uh, they won the Serie yeah, A, was. which was a big deal. Yeah. But during COVID, they lost so much money mm. that they still had to. First of all, uh, like I think I don't think they paid like for June, and players were like, "All right, that's fine with us." Yeah, you know, they didn't. They did that. Now then, they said, "Okay, uh, Conte met with the president." And uh, we have Chinese presidents, so yeah. they lost a lot more money than anybody else. Yeah, and uh, uh, Conte resigned after that because after the meeting, because they didn't have any plans to get more players and to compete in Champions League. Conte wanted a certain level of yeah. uh, income. So it's, it's a build year. Right? Exactly, it's a building year. This exactly, thing, yeah. and they said no. He left, so they got Simone Inzaghi, which is he's fine. Yeah, he's not the worst guy, but he's not Conte, or at yeah, least he hasn't no. shown himself as Conte. Yeah. He's been in Lazio for the last like five, six years, and he's done some really good stuff with Lazio, but not you know, yeah, that level. Conte is a then it's like a exactly legend, you know? there's a whole <laughs> another guy, yeah. yeah, and he proved it now. He yeah. won after Inter won after ten years, yeah, fucking, and Juventus exactly. domination. Like he finally we broke the cycle, yeah. But and then they said we gotta sell at least one top guy. It could be Martinez. Lautaro Martinez, Hakimi, 
Uh, they had a couple other names. They did sell Hakimi to PSG. That was like a big blow blow for us because he had this one great season. Only one we wanted to see him more and he loved yeah. being an Inter. And then we sold Lukaku. I don't know if you've heard yeah, of that. Yeah, no. Who did, where did he go? Chelsea. Back to Back Chelsea. Back to Chelsea. It's incredible because they offered 100, K, 100 mil and yeah. we said no. Yeah. And then they offered 120 plus bonuses. And Inter was like 120. That's like, that's a lot. Yeah. Like even still for like two days, like for, I, you know, that's the highest look you can sell Lukaku for. Like that's yeah. quite a price. He's I mean, 28. I mean, I he's kind of peak yeah. his career possibly, you know. He's shown, you know, really definitely raised yeah, his and level. Yeah, Champions League yeah. year also, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, and they let him go. But the thing is that we got fucking Dzeko instead. Yeah. A 35-year-old Bosnian who is like, okay, definitely had his days. In a, it's, yeah. They even talked about selling Lautaro Martinez. Hmm. We're going to have with fucking, with bricks in our fucking, <laughs> like. So the, 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 the team is like very, like the, the fans, the team's a little demoralized. We lost a good coach, two really good top guys. Can't yeah. sell a lot of all smaller guys. Yeah, it's disappointing because like you just won the title and now you're like, okay, well that's, now we're definitely not winning the title. Again. Definitely not <laughs> like, and, and we kind of we're not competing in Champions League. Yeah, you know? even though it's like you're gonna be there now, it's like all right, well, yeah, yeah. there's no, there's not, a, yeah. there's no chance. We got like a a good like a uh, right back instead. We got yeah. the uh, the Dutch guy uh, Dumfries, mm. Denzel Dumfries, yeah, yeah, yeah. for like twelve million, which is crazy price. Yeah. He scored like two or three goals in like a Euro. Yeah, like he's like one eighty nine centimeters, what is like oh, six yeah. four or yeah, something, yeah, right? Nuts. For That's a right back, tall. like yeah. very tall, a very interesting guy, young. Yeah. So I'm kind of excited for that because uh, one thing about Hakimi, I always thought he has low uh, play like game IQ. Mm. He's very strong. He's very yeah. fast. Like one of the fastest guys out there. Yeah. Can shoot, can do everything, but he doesn't play always very smart. Yeah. This guy seems very intelligent. Um, knows the game, I think, better. And we got him for like 12 mil. I think that's a fine like alternative. But in the in the um in the attack, I mean, nobody can replace Lukaku. Yeah. But they're trying to get now. You remember uh, Turam? The the I think he was a center back or a left back. I don't in know. Juventus, like yeah. a French guy, too wrong. Yeah. But his oh, son, yeah, his yeah. son is playing now, and he's a, uh, I think in, in Germany, I think Borussia, um, the Mon Mon Gladbach, yeah, Mon Gladbach or something like that. Like oh, this with him. Yeah, he's their guy, like 20, 22 or something. Uh, so might get him, but we'll see, man. It's gonna be an interesting year, yeah. but I feel like it's a little downer everywhere. Yeah, like, I mean, except for Paris, right? Paris and yeah. fucking England. <laughs> yeah, they're getting yeah, everybody. They're, they're, yeah. Like it's unbelievable. Nah. Like Premier League is like on fire. How yeah. many teams do you have that are fighting every yeah. year? Exactly. Like no, Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United. Right. Now is really good. Chelsea, yeah. Tottenham. All these teams are like up there. Yeah, they, right. you never know. I think it is. It might be the most exciting like championship. I mean, it is, it has been, but yeah, no, it's it's, it's crazy. more so than ever. I mean, yeah. England's been doing very well in in general, like with the with internationally, like yeah. they've been they've, their clubs yeah. have been doing well, which is funny because uh, I mean they made it to the final mm -hmm. internationally, but besides this year, I mean England hasn't done I guess well on the international level for yeah uh, a long time. I mean they've been like they, kind of unlucky, yeah, like, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they they hope to break the cycle with Italy, but yeah, no, no. Italy just were better at yeah, the penalties. Italy, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I, I understand you about being down. I mean, there's a downtime at Barcelona because like right now it's like very like. I mean, but that's a big one. That's like it gives like down for for everybody. You know, Barcelona, yeah. Messi. That's like. That's like, know, but sad. it's like, but it's like, all right, thinking of the, the future. It's like, all right, you you get Aguero, who Aguero has it, been unhealthy I mean, for years. Yeah, like he's been an inconsistent. I think he's an amazing player, but he's sure. been inconsistent. But he's not looking in the yeah. future. No, kind of and guy. you know he just got injured actually oh. in training. He's out for four months at least. Wow! So it's like, <laughs> okay, yeah. and and Sufati is getting injured more and more. Then oh, yeah. has been injured at this point for years, and it doesn't look like he's getting better. And I think I like last week. I think read Dembele is like he has to get like a surgery now. He's out for six months. It's like is Coutinho still around? <laughs> Oh, they're trying to sell him. Oh yeah, yeah. I think they're. I think Arsenal was looking at a mm -hmm. like a, a purchase. Yeah, maybe back to England might be a yeah, good but, um, move for him. 
But yeah, no, it's it's a bad time in Barcelona as well. I think overall, like, yeah. the, it's uncertain where the club is. So who is uh, coaching Real Madrid now? Still Zidane or no? Yeah, isn't it? Oh, he's dead? Yeah, yeah. I oh, okay. So. Yeah. All right. What's the Real Madrid doing? They bought anything? I mean, well, it's funny. Well, I'm talking about, like, players leaving. Ramos. Oh, like, yeah. That was crazy. Like, that's, it's crazy. Yeah, like, it's crazy. That's, like, unbe- like. I saw this, uh, uh, you saw Messi and Ramos, like, shaking hands. Yeah. But the, 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 there, there was a, uh, um, somebody commented, and yeah. I even posted that. Yeah. Somebody made a comment. It's like, um, what do they say? It was something along the lines like, it's like Thanos and Captain America shaking yeah. hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, no, it's, I mean, I, I, you know, I get memories of like the Galactico squad yeah, of 2007. Yeah. Was it 2007, 2006 Madrid? Before, 2003, and, you know, four, three, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I'm getting like memories of that. And I feel like oh, they a part of me, is, yeah, exactly. But that's why I'm saying, yeah. I'm saying yeah. Paris, I, I think they oh. could fail spectacularly. Yeah, because you know all these stars, they don't. That does, I mean, it's been proven. It doesn't necessarily contri- like no. make the best team either. No, no. And there's a lot of stars at PSG. It's like a ridiculous it's crazy, squad. Yeah. It's, <laughs> ridiculous. it's like an absolutely ridiculous team. But I have a feeling that they might do poorly. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, hey, they could probably just. They, I mean, then they destroy every team. I but. mean, it was kind of crazy. Like it, this champ, past champions, like was quite fun. Yeah, no, it was because <laughs> like, uh, what's the guy who coaches Chelsea? I forget his name. Uh, um the french guy i forget his name you know what i'm talking yeah, yeah, about right yeah. he was at psg yeah and i was hoping that psg is gonna be in the finals against yeah. chelsea yeah that would have been even more dramatic because yeah. he left exactly, psg yeah. and now he's still in the finals and wins against psg that that yeah. would like that would have been crazy yeah poor psg i feel bad but also it's not fun like i wish yeah. french uh championship is like boring yeah like i don't monaco is doing something but like uh, I mean, really? well, it's, a, it's it's funny when you get the outside investor, it seems to just really change yeah. the, I mean, we're currently, I mean, how many of the, how many of the top clubs in Europe are, are owned domestically at this yeah. point? No. Like, I think only the, maybe the Spanish clubs like Barcelona, Madrid, but I think a lot of the other top, I mean, everyone's getting bought out. Everybody is like uh, Americans, yeah. uh, Chinese, uh, Arabs. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Paris was bought out when, like six years ago now, I seven know. years ago? I, I think it was like, yeah. 10 years maybe 10 yeah and i remember remember that happening yeah i remember that happening and then paris was like not a leon was considered like the team yeah leon was (laughs) champions for 10 years exactly paris paris was not a team anyone talked about yeah and then money there was strictly psg yeah paris saint germain people would say that the whole full thing now it's just Paris. Yeah, exactly. It's like, which is <laughs> yeah, fun. Yeah, I, yeah, I actually yeah, like it. Yeah. Paris is like Milan. Like, it's good. I yeah. like that name, Paris. No. Uh, but it was a good team, but it wasn't like no, top. it wasn't like top. Like, it wasn't top. Yeah. And now, of course, they're, they they own the it's they crazy. own the league. You know? They own the league. But that's yeah. just boring. I wish uh, those guys bought like some uh, Italian t- club or something. Yeah. Well, you know, exactly. And, uh, we need to add some spice. No, for sure. I mean, it's... Because it's like it's only a champion. Like the team only really. I mean, obviously they play in the league, but the Champions League is, I guess, what they yeah they need to do. And but honestly, I think they lost the championship a couple yeah. times too in the last ten years. Yeah, yeah it's not have. like they, they didn't win every year. Yeah, they which is you know crazy. Yeah, it is crazy with the amount of. I mean, if you look at the the gap in salaries, probably from them to the number two team. I'm sure there's uh, like a, <laughs> there's a, a, a ridiculous yeah, know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a ridiculous salary yeah. gap. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But no, it's uh, I I th- I do think that though there's an opportunity for Messi here. I mean, because you know we're coming to this World Cup now, and this is yeah his last World Cup, you know. So yeah, I I don't know. A part of me is wants to believe that maybe if Messi starts playing with a new club, learns some things, and really starts getting ready for this next year. I feel like Argentina has been like the PSG <laughs> of the World Cup. Well, they definitely were at least like I remember. The Cup America. Last 20 years, yeah. on and off, they've had the best yeah. looking team ever. Yeah. Well, Cup America 2000. Oh, man. What, what year was this? 2015, 16, 14? Mm-hmm. When they had, uh, who was it? Tevez. Oh, yeah. Messi, Di Maria, Iguain. Max Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all La, those La, guys. La uh, Vesi. Mascherano. Yeah. Max Rodriguez, who else? Like a couple other. Yeah, a couple other mid, midfield. It's yeah. like, it just. It was, a, yeah, it was a crazy team. Like, and they didn't do anything. 
Yeah. Really, they didn't do well. I mean, you could say, I guess Argentina did reach a final in the World Cup, mm-hmm. but for some reason, again, people seem to have forgotten that because I don't. I think that was, actually that final game I think was pretty bad overall. I didn't really mm-hmm. necessarily enjoy that. No, no. Well, World Cup finals I think tend to also be very. I mean, because think yeah. about it, it's like the 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 most competitive thing you're gonna yeah. see. So yeah. you're not gonna see a lot of like chances. You know? Yeah. If you do, yeah. then something is wrong. Yeah, World Cup finals. And what I've seen lately is they tend to be very tense. Mm-hmm. You could tell the players are on edge. I mean, obviously everyone's yeah. on edge, you know, and it's it becomes a very. It's usually not a, a beautiful game. Yeah, I would say Brazil. I remember that one pretty well. Brazil Germany 2002. Uh, yeah. That was like Brazil won. Yeah. And they won kind of in every aspect, but it was like a nice. It was a beautiful yeah. game. Ronaldo scored. I think both. Yeah. That was a good game. Uh, but yeah, like Italy, uh, France was. Yeah, it was uh, uh, boring, was a, but yeah. the drama. Yeah, the that drama happened was, was great. Fun, and, yeah, they're usually just very much they're like almost the point of violent games. Usually, they're usually yeah. very a lot of fouls, a lot yeah. of tech. It's usually yeah. much more technically safe. Yeah, especially you know? when you play with Italians. It's yeah, like they they get very yeah. And Messi, nasty. and they'll be honest. I think I've always felt Messi Messi chokes on Argentina. Mm-hmm. He he misses goals that in Barcelona under worse circumstances he nails easily and. I don't know. I, I do feel like he feels the pressure way more on Argentina because there's I I was actually in Uruguay mm-hmm. when they played that one. I think it was 2014 Copa America. I, don't, I forget which year, but I was there and it was Argentina Uruguay in the semifinal. Mm-hmm. And 92nd minute, Messi is in front of the goal by himself. And in my mind, like, oh, Messi doesn't miss this. He shoots it wide of the net. Oh, God. And I was like, I don't think I've ever seen Messi miss, like miss that. like this. But yeah, and then they lost in penalties. Gee, man. Yeah. It's, I mean, it was like, it's, yeah, Messi does choke in, in ways, I think, on the on the international team that he doesn't choke on. Yeah. He doesn't choke in Barcelona. Yeah, it's, uh, who was, uh, I mean, that's like the moment when, uh, I don't know if how well you remember, but 2010 final. Yeah. When uh, uh, Robin went one on one with uh, who was the goalie in Spain then? Oh, Casillas. Was it no? Casillas? Yeah, Still, yeah, it was. yeah, it was. And you know, Casillas saved, but it was like yeah. literally one on one. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. very no, kind of at the end. It was, yeah. it was in the ninety minutes. Uh, and you think Rob? How does he miss these? Yeah, I remember yeah. like he it doesn't was miss. A, these. I remember like, it was <laughs> like Snyder was on the floor. He was yeah. on the ground and he gave the ball one on one with Robin. Yeah. I mean, it's Casillas, sure. Yeah, but no, but, but still, no goalie still. has any right like. Get, no. saving that at that no. in that no. position in that yeah. position in that with that pressure it was yeah. it was it was pure should have been a goal yeah like it was something like 80th minute or yeah. like somewhere closer to the end they go to uh extra time i think that's when iniesta scores right yeah the, uh, the, the, like 120th 119th yeah. or something yeah and then he scored the yeah he, he was in the right place at the right time with exactly that one. yeah he was <laughs> yeah yeah that one was you like know. uh it was just like the gutsy goal Oh, yeah, uh, in the four years later with yeah. Germany, like no, for boring sure. goal, but yeah, a b- boring game. That was like a yeah. very weird one. I mean, yeah, what's interesting about that year too is that Spain. Obviously, Spain on paper was the best team, but they didn't yeah. necessarily win every game. No, like they didn't dominate every game. But there was there was games where they played beautifully, and I think those were the ones people remember, and the games that they dominated. But a couple of the games, like the one where Puyol scored that header, which mm. one was that? I don't remember. Puyol scored this like just humongous header to to win the game, but until that, I think it was like tied zero right, zero, right, right, and so right, it's like right. it, they they did have thin margins when they yeah when they won yeah interesting um yeah I remember even uh, when like Inter uh, and Inter fans like just that's the game that they will remember forever is when they we beat Barcelona yeah, in semifinals I remember in that, yeah I remember that game it was like very important for us but if you watch documentaries or like players talk about it yeah. And they said what Mourinho like said is like you're not a better team. Yeah, they're the best team in the world, which they were. Yeah, like they won yeah, Champions sure. League year before. They won Champions League year after that. 20, 2009, though we won to twenty eleven, yeah. twenty ten semifinals. They could have easily won, but Mourinho just outsmarted uh, Guardiola. They yeah. out- outplayed him. Out. Yeah. It was just all tactics, and he just you know was able to use his players you know better that's yeah. it i mean in retrospect looking at that it's like it always made me feel like Mourinho is just such much more of a complete coach in that sense mm-hmm. 
I mean, Guardiola built a team that was the best team in the world with a strategy that in 90% of situations just usually dominated every other yeah. team, but wasn't able to adapt. Like, clearly this one st- counter strategy worked. And it wasn't a secret either. Like, again, there was two games. Like, yeah. there was, like, it yeah. was known that it wasn't, like, a super secret, but Guardiola clearly just... Did it? I mean, uh, maybe yeah. they, maybe the team, and not maybe Guardiola's fault. Maybe the team itself was like, "This is how we play. We're not going to play different." You know, yeah. this is. But clearly, it's just all right. You're not gonna. They weren't gonna win that way. Yeah, right? no. The second game was like all. I was just, uh, you know, uh, ready to like die because yeah. it was so nerve wracking, and um, they parked the bus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're no. like, with, of course, he let all the midfielders. Every he he got a bunch of defenders. The Inter finished game with like four center backs or something yeah. you know what i mean and <laughs> yeah. two uh, defensive midfielders like yeah. Eto'o was in the front yeah. just like yeah. just for, for for accessory yeah uh but uh, then uh, i pique scored one like if barcelona had like 10 more minutes they might have scored yeah i mean that's you know? the thing that's interesting i mean that's again barcelona there's a world where they won that game anyways like the yeah. strategy was correct but Barcelona was so good that they yeah. still could have won under yeah, different yeah. circumstances. It could have sure. gone either way, honestly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It could have, yes, for sure. Yeah. It was definitely like a stretch. Yeah. And I remember, uh, you remember that guy, Boyan? He was... Yeah, playing. I remember him, yeah. Boyan something. His what career was is pretty much over now. I mean, yeah, where does he play now? Like, yeah, he doesn't. He didn't play now. Yeah, but he scored at, at like 82nd minute yeah. or 83rd. And then there was a handball. They found a coach. So there was a handball earlier. Yeah. But honestly, in with VAR today... Hmm. I would be like they they might have been like oh there was no handball like yeah. it was kind of it was a controversial moment and well, we got lucky. Well, I found it hilarious that people thought, or I, including me, I thought the VAR was gonna okay finally now we'll know the truth and yeah. now that we have the VAR you're like oh this is really up to opinions now isn't it like like even with looking yeah. at even looking at the camera so, some moments are just this this is an opinion at this point this could go either way you know like. Yeah. But don't you think it's still better than not? Having I think it? it's better because, like, there's unforgettable, unforgivable moments I mean, in World Cups. Oh yeah, I mean the Maradona. Maradona <laughs> yeah, that yeah. wouldn't have happened for like, sure. You know, that wouldn't for sure. But even like later, you know, uh, that one kind of happened, and we're happy that it happened. We yeah. don't want that change. Yeah. You know, we just <laughs> yeah, love yeah. it. The hand of God thing. Yeah. But there's so many times when the ball was in, yeah. and they scored, but then. The referee didn't see it or whatever, and they yeah. just didn't count for it. Yeah, right? no, I think it's a positive change. Yeah. I do think so. Um, I think there's a element of people that they love the oh unpredictability of soccer, yeah. and they love that these things could happen. But I'm like, yeah, you love it when it happens in your favor, yeah. but when it yeah. happens and not in your favor, it's a terrible yeah. moment. Yeah, like you know? I watched this game and Inter was playing, and uh, we ended up winning like one zero. But yeah. if our they allowed three goals. So yeah. there was, it was like, it would have been 4 0 if it wasn't for VAR, right? Mm, and yeah. uh, <clears throat> they like disallowed three goals. Yeah. And my point is that, uh, like, that's that's unfair, basically. Yeah. 4 0 is too much. <laughs> the other team would have been like, not, but they, they gave us like a fair game till the yeah. end. They could have been 1 1 or something. Yeah. So three goals, that's a lot. All three yeah. goals were not goals. There was offside or hand or whatever. Every yeah. three, all three times, it was something that they saw. L- remember the uh, Spain, uh, Korea, uh, 2002? Don't remember that. Well, one, that no. was uh, one of the most, well, people, there's a lot of like conspiracy theories and stuff, but people say it's the most embarrassing World Cup ever. And yeah. uh, Korea, uh, Spain, they disallowed three goals from Spain. Hmm. And the, like, it was like what why and they weren't like they were literally opinions like yeah. you said but i feel like nowadays with var with a lot more controversy you can't just disallow three goals yeah like uh and spain didn't go through uh i think it was semifinal yeah. uh semi uh, it was a quarterfinal hmm. because i think korea won't put, played in semifinal yeah no i mean the var definitely opens up i mean i think it's a positive change you know it's funny i mean i remember that this I think like now, like eight, close upon like seven, eight years ago, the, the I felt like the Real Madrid Barcelona rivalry. I mean, it's always hot, but was mm-hmm. at a peak with like Danny Alves. Yeah, seen it. There was sure. it was like a moment where it was like okay, Ronaldo was on. Yeah. It was like there was a moment where it was like all right, this is like at its peak, and <clears throat> there was like games where there's like memorable fouls. Like I think the one where Danny Alves raised his leg and Ramos like cut him down. But then yeah. when you looked at the replay, you see. 
he didn't actually touch Danny Alves. Danny Alves threw himself, and it was like so amazing that Ramos's leg foot came to here, and Danny Alves was right here, and then Danny Alves threw himself. Yeah. So to anyone, obviously, just looking, I, I think it's like inhumanly possible to think that For Ramos sure. didn't kick, like try to break his leg. Yeah. And but of course. You know, in the moment, yeah, there was no VAR back then. Yeah. 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 And obviously, Ramos got a red card for that. And yeah. then, yeah, and Barcelona, I mean, obviously, changed that changed the whole game. And that wouldn't happen today. But also, if I'm not remember, there don't, there don't seem to be fouls like that. I mean, maybe it's because the VAR exists now and they're like, oh, wait, we know that there might be a yeah, replay. They adapt, now, you, know, you know, which is fine. They adapt. Yeah. Hopefully, there's less of that kind of uh, fakery, fakery, which yeah. has been like openly happening. I don't get it. Like, that's been like such a part of the game. Yeah faking you know yeah. that someone touched your face well, got in your eyes you know it's funny i'm not sure if, again from the cup america th- there was a big critique of neymar overall yeah. after this most recent cup america mm-hmm. because they were saying that neymar is the captain of, of the brazilian team you know mm-hmm. he's you know, the brazilian team overall is pretty young you know the one that t- they took to the cup america yeah. and one of the biggest critiques they said of the game though was that Neymar didn't lead the team. Lead, In yeah, fact, yeah. there's like Neymar actually worsened the team because mm-hmm. he had a you know it's points in the he lost his temper clearly uh, uh, several points in the game, and he was more you know he was looking for a fight you know and obviously Neymar has always been the he's gotten better but still he's very much oh touch he he can you know, yeah, every foul sure. he gets he definitely tries to play it up, and they were saying that there was a key moment in like the 80th minute. I think 70th minute where the, the game could have gone either way. It was like a very heated moment. Brazil could have scored very easily. And Vinicius came on, but Vinicius seemed to really take on Neymar's lead of like, mm-hmm. oh, dude, like, yeah, these Argentinians are trying to like fuck with us. Like, let's. Vinicius entered and you could tell he was heated. He was like, you know, and he's like, what, like 20, I yeah, think, 19, you know? Like he was clearly very heated and he was looking to, he was getting into a fight with, I forget which Argentinian. He was get, basically just getting into fights and. They weren't focused on seeming to score. They were more like yeah. very riled up. Right, and right, right. you could say that's Neymar's influence, though. Neymar's yeah. clearly influencing the team as the captain. Negative. And there was like a critique that, yeah, Neymar didn't lead the team. And that's that's like a big part why Brazil didn't beat Argentina. Interesting. You know? Because on paper, Brazil had by far the best team this Copa America. Mm-hmm. Like a better team than Argentina, for sure, on, on paper. But, um, I mean, yeah, Messi still uh, pulled it off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? I was work. <laughs> yeah, we do. We did a soccer. But did, uh, <laughs> yeah. quite so, I yeah. mean, I satisfied my my yeah. my itch. Yeah, I, I don't have anybody to talk to yeah. about soccer with. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, work has been good. I mean, June, something. I mean, obviously, I think this with the vaccination increase. I think people are like, all right, now we can, uh, now we can start working again. And June mm-hmm. just came, and then work just kind of started flooding in. Everyone, Finally. everyone I know has been crazy busy since June, essentially, like working all the t- every day. And there's a lot of work just pumping through, like basically whatever work we didn't get last year is mm-hmm. came back to this summer. I mean, I think it's unclear wh- what's going to happen now. And the, now that we go back to the winter, I mean, but I mean, I don't know, but it's so far it's been great, mm-hmm. you know. So um, just. I think it would be just interesting, uh, even if some stories I've already heard, but for people yeah. listening, um, just uh, give me some top like guys you work with. Like I know you did some music videos or some other things oh, for yeah, like some yeah, cool guys. For sure. I want to hear some stories about uh, how working with those uh, <laughs> drama queens. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you did the video safe. for uh, Kodak Black. Yeah, I did a video for Kodak Black. Who else video for that? Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, Anthony Ramos. Uh, I, I don't know most of these guys, yeah, but yeah. No, still. They're, you know they're they're popular people. Uh, I've been lucky to work with uh, some good directors. You know that brought me on these projects. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder how much I can safely reveal as far oh. as like you know, like I mean, like <laughs> I see. Um, all right, well, I'll I'll, I'll keep it anonymous. Maybe, okay, let's to, do that. To the yeah. artist, let's but I'll that. tell you, yeah. um, I'll tell you the stories. Okay, let's go. <laughs> but um, we were in, I was in. LA. I mean, this is like obviously. Listen, music videos. There, everyone knows what they are. They're they're tough shoots, usually one day or two day shoots, but they're usually very tough. They're under budgeted. In my experience, always under budgeted. Like it doesn't matter if it, the budget's five thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. They're always under what they should be. So mm-hmm. everyone is really stressed. And obviously, turnarounds. Like sometimes you'll get confirmation. Oh, two days before, 
yeah, let's put together a fifty thousand dollars shoot in two days, oh. and then it's like everyone is working twenty four hours like for two days and just. I mean, everyone, everyone possible is like trying to work crazy to get everyone booked. And it's amazing that they happen, but they do. But um, I was in this one shoot in L.A. We were shooting in the in the desert. And uh, <laughs> it's like it was like this interesting. I forget the name of the place, but it's like an interesting like it's outside. Of, it's like an hour and a half outside of L.A. actually. But it's like a, it's like a diner area and they have like a little um it's like meant for shooting they they uh-huh. have it there just for sh- purpose of shooting but uh it's like a gas fake gas station fake diner and a lot of people shoot there it's actually a pretty popular shooting location but uh, we were shooting a, a music video out there and uh me and the you know me and the director we drove in this case we drove the picture car there uh-huh. and the, the picture car was a i remember it was a 60 67 uh impala i uh-huh. believe mm uh-huh. You know, and, you know, we, we picked up the picture car in the morning and hit the set. And, you know, we get the set and we have a, you know, we have a treatment. We have a plan. We, you know, we're going to do all these things. We have like a, we have a, a couple of condors. We were going to do some pretty crazy stuff with like mm-hmm. some car rigs. We had like a whole plan for the day. But uh, so, you know, we get there and we start setting up. We start setting up the car. And we hear, of course, that the artist is is running late, which is not uncommon honestly mm-hmm. like oh yeah artist is running late may might be here in a, in a couple hours mm-hmm. so we're like okay that's um you know that sucks but not uh not completely unexpected either so we keep moving through our day you know and then the the artist does show up and you know me and the director are called like the ad comes to us and says hey um the artist wants to, to speak to you guys i'm like oh okay so we go to the to the Esca, the Cadillac that he came in. And, you know, he, he doesn't get out of the car. He rolls down the window. And he says, I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? What's up? Like, he's like, uh, you guys, you guys realize that we're in a, we're in a lay right now, right? And, you know, me and, me and the driver, like, what, what does this mean? Like, <laughs> like, uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, what's up? And he's like, well, this song that I, that I wrote, I wrote this song in Miami and I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah. He's like, you, you don't see the problem with that. Oh and my I'm like, God. I'm like, uh, I, I, no, I'm sorry. Uh, like, like, so I wrote this song in Miami and we're in LA. So we can't shoot this song. So, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm more taking a back seat. I'm like, okay, this is definitely not the director's yeah. <laughs> like the director has to make a comment here. And you know, he says, um, yeah. Sorry, my my phone's ringing. Oh, but okay. whatever. Let me just. Do you want to just like take a look? Yeah. Just... Don't Turn it off. Oh uh, yeah. We can throw it in the dishwasher. All right. Cool. Yeah. We just uh, put on airplane mode. Um, cool. No worries. But um, yeah. More directors. So, yeah. So I'm like, so director is uh. At this point, the director was also kind of newer, so maybe not as seasoned to the whims of a, of an artist, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like a pop, a very pop celebrity, essentially. So he's, you know, he's he clearly he's a bit he's stressing out a little bit, you know. Which funny nowadays he probably he's a bit more experienced now. He'd probably be like, okay, yeah, whatever, you know. He's mm-hmm. <laughs> like, but back then, you know, he was he was like, hey, um. But didn't you look at the the treatment that I sent over? Like, you know, there's a very specific like we have a whole idea and. Of course, like no, he didn't see. Like he's like, oh, no, I didn't. I didn't look at that. Like I, I don't care. Like whatever. We're we're doing a different song, and we're like, oh, oh my, oh my god. Like, okay, well, we get it. So he gives us a new song that he wants to do, and the song is very different, and like it's a just a completely different song, and so you know we go to the the label and the label, and he goes, hey, can he do this? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and then like he's like the label, like yeah, yeah I mean. You know, he can do whatever he wants, like whatever. And then, uh, so basically, the shoot's on hold, and the director comes. He's like, "Hey, so I need to build a new concept, and we're four hours into our shooting day, God. and we only have that day to make it work." And so we're like, "He's like, all right, can you just like move the set along? Just start shooting stuff." And I was like, "Oh, what? Oh what do God. I shoot?" And he's like. I don't, Dave, like, he's like, I just, you know, we just need to, we just need to do something. So yeah, just start getting like some interesting shots. I'm going to try to build out this new concept. So 
I go back to the set and basically, you know, we have like a full, we have a, a full set. There's a, we have like a diner filled with people. There's extras. There's, you know, it's already fully lit. It's like, and so I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, let's start getting the extras. Let's start just shooting, I guess, interesting things. Wow. And basically, yeah, I'm just passing the time along while, uh. A concept. The director's out, yeah. building a new, an entirely new concept. So we don't. Need, I don't even know if the stuff we've shot up until this point is even valid, like for this new concept. But just had to, you know, keep it, uh, keep it going. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean that's like yeah. a big thing, though. Like yeah. in this uh, business, um, I feel it happens on many different levels right yeah. i mean that's like an extreme one where the yeah. artist just completely wants to change the artist is the person yeah. who should be on the same page with director yeah. might be kind of excited about what we're doing more involved but if he you know that person yeah. didn't re- even read the treatment that's yeah, incredible yeah, for sure but i guess that's like the reality of this business is that you gotta adapt and there's no there's never like a no we're not doing it like how's that like how do you navigate that and how do you what what, what kind of personality uh <laughs> you have to have to be able to adapt to these kind of things. That's, uh, yeah. that's well, not easy. Well, it's interesting because uh, bringing that up. So obviously the what you're bringing up, I think there's a very true thing where it's like, it's very hard to say no. And I think everyone I know walks, walks the, a line com- differently. I don't think any, I don't think there's a right answer as to when you say no or when you don't necessarily, mm-hmm. because everyone walks the path differently. Some people are much more inclined to say no or like be like, hey, no, I'm not going to do this. Some people are much more inclined to say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I'll make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I do feel that as if you're as the higher up you go, as far as like you're producing or directing or um, or even DPing something, I think sometimes the, the question is asked a lot of how far are you willing to go to to keep this project going because uh ridiculous questions are always asked and ridiculous timelines are expected and ridiculous ske- i mean every everything's ridiculous and it trickles down because everyone ends up you know everyone ends up suffering per se for it but um yeah i, I don't even think i have a good answer honestly i think mm-hmm. it's like i think everyone just navigates it differently um it's yeah. very stressful um i've personally found that the best way to deal with it is uh I like to be constantly on a lighter note with things. I like to kind of laugh things off and try to seem like it doesn't affect me, even though I might be stressing out mm-hmm. heavily internally. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's a it's it's an interesting job, uh, uh, production at that level. It's it's weird because like you know sometimes it's like yeah, if you say no, then you just might pass up on an opportunity or. If you are on the job and you say no, I, I can't do this. This can't. This this just doesn't work. The the sad thing is that someone else is willing to do it. Probably exactly. Yeah. So you might just not lose an opportunity. You know, and you know maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe like okay, I don't want to. I don't want to work with these people if they're gonna force me to do this or they are asking me this of me. But you know, it's a uh, that's that's a personal. I mean, that's up to you. You know, I mean, you have to draw a line mm-hmm. of what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do constantly you know it's a it's an it's a hard field you know it's and i guess i I don't i don't have a good answer for us to like how to navigate it you know yeah i feel like it's so um like i i have a colleague of mine uh who i'm (laughs) planning to bring uh, on the podcast but he worked on uh in the stunt department Mm -hmm. um yeah and uh on joker and he did sopranos the new one that's coming out yeah and uh you know, like you, I've never been like worked on a big set like that. And, uh, uh, like there's even, so they tell everybody never run. Yeah. Right. Never run on set because it just creates anxiety. It just feels like somebody is not doing something right. Somebody is totally. over yeah. and it's just not a good look. It's not like image. It just creates, you know, bad atmosphere. Totally. And, uh, that's the kind of world we work in really. And, uh, um, you know, you hear things like, for example, if I ask you to do something, it's like, oh, hey, we're changing this to that. And you're like, oh, just that. Yeah. Oh, 
will I might not hire you next time because I yeah. don't want to see you roll your eyes. I don't want to see your frustration. Yeah. Because I just don't want to deal with that. It's difficult. It's annoying for everybody. Let's we gotta just do it. Oh, right. Yeah. A big part of this 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 feel is image, man. Like you gotta. Yeah. I always uh tell I guess the the younger folk or whoever's going. It's like, hey, you need to do a good job, but maybe more importantly, maybe not. You need to look good doing oh. a good job. You need to. You need to make it seem like this is cool because you need to just ultimately you need to somehow inspire confidence in your own way because everyone's stressed. Yeah. Like everyone is anxious. That's that's the reality, especially on like a, a day with big expectations. Probably a lot. 90 percent of the crew is anxious about doing this because they're not sure it's going to work. Now, I found good crew is very good at hiding that they're anxious and just seeming like oh yeah this is fine even though on the inside they might be like i don't know this is gonna work like this is this could be terrible but it's a uh, ah, set to be honest that's a bunch of sharks man like uh, people on sharks, set are a bunch of yeah. sharks. everyone's looking for like the weak one everyone's looking for like and maybe not this is not the best way to describe it it's like everyone is very hyper aware as to how a person is reacting to a situation you think it's, uh, because you know? uh, uh set people have a lot of egos yeah, no, I mean, some people have, you have, I, I believe you have to have a, an ego to work in this, really. That doesn't mean you have to be, like, egotistical or be, like, a, a dick or an asshole to people. But you have to have a good amount of self-confidence if you want to work in this field. You know, you have to be able to believe in what you're doing and push for what you want to do. I mean, obviously, there's times when you need to be stern and you need to, and there's times when you need to, you know, really just say this is how it needs to be. And I don't know, but sometimes there's also not. So I don't know. It's it's like I said, it's always like a weird, uh, there's not a correct way necessarily. It's like everyone does things a little bit differently. But but as far as like looking, yeah, no running. Yeah, you need to, you can't show that you're freaking out. I think if you show that you're freaking right, out is right, when, because right. I found that ultimately, and this is in my experience, because I think uh, I've never been one to freak out on set. But I think what I've realized, though, is that, uh, whether or not sometimes yeah listen as a dp sometimes i shoot something that looks like shit man i'm not gonna lie like i'm mm -hmm. shooting it and i'm like yep this looks um pretty terrible yeah it, it did a bad job now i'm bummed because we have to sit and look at this image for probably like the next hour but you can't show that mm -hmm. and i found that the people of the people that are hiring me producing directors as long as i don't seem to show that i think this looks not amazing they don't seem to realize either that it's but not here's amazing. A, but you know? here's like, the thing. But here's the thing. Like, and I'm curious. I yeah. I don't have an answer neither. Uh, what if a director relies on you saying that? Hey, I don't think this looks good because of this and that. Should we change something? I think we should change something. Yeah. Like, no. do you think that's a part of being a good DP? Yeah, totally. I mean, be me. Obviously. Oh come on! You were doing so good. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So I guess just to put the situation, so let's say I'm shooting something, I set up a frame, I set up, a, we were 30 minutes into it and it doesn't look good mm -hmm. and we're already kind of late and the director comes up and says it doesn't look good. I mean, that's uh, that's what we call a uh, number one uh, stressful situation. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, that's probably the top stressful yeah. situation where you're like, or director or client agency producer says, this doesn't, oh yeah, I mean, how do we change this? This doesn't, doesn't look right. That's probably the most stressful situation a DP is ever in, mm -hmm. of being like, okay, time to time to change things. And I found personally navigating it is that you just need to make a decision. And obviously, you rely on your expertise, you rely on your experience, you rely on you're relying on your. This is the part where I guess the skill of cinematographer comes through. It's like yes, you rely on your skills to try to see what is the correct decision here. But you need to make a decision. Um, that's the other part of you just need to seem confident, you know. Um, it's a, And then obviously it's a talking game. You need to be able to talk your way out of it, kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, just talk and make it seem that, you know, obviously maybe it is your fault. But you need to, you know, it's, it's the whole game is like, yeah, is like about talking. You need to talk away like, oh, you know, this. Oh, yeah, this is look. I think this is the problem. So why don't we do this differently? You know, you just need to obviously look like you have solutions mm -hmm. and even if you don't and you need to rely on your experience and your expertise to try to make it better or 
at least change it up enough so that the director, the client, whoever is uh, is happy with it as well. And I mean, and ideally, you're happy with it, honestly. Well, but, that's you know, I guess my thing yeah, here, ideally. right? Like, if it's all collaborative, uh, like I understand, like you feel like most of the jobs, yeah. you know, you do is like you feel like you're hired. As far as they're happy, you're yeah. fine. But I'm talking about the work that you want to put on your resume, the work I that see. you want to put on your portfolio. Uh, do you try to achieve? I see. Don't get me wrong. I guess time. I guess I'm speaking more in terms of maybe commercial work because right. honestly, that's probably the majority of what I do. Mm-hmm. Now, in the situation on a collaborative narrative, I think my approach, and I don't do too much narrative. I, I wish I could. I would do more, but I don't do too much. But in my approach, with what I've done narrative, I think my approach is slightly different. I'm looking for what I think gets the story across, mm-hmm. and I do feel like it's. With the directors I worked with narratively, it's been a collaborative effort. Like, okay, yeah, I think this looks good. I think this looks better because I think this tells a story. So there's no surprises, talk about basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, obviously there's I mean, it it set. Be, you know, right. they're set. But like, you know, the director might disagree with you, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, ultimately, it is more of a collaborative and you're going. So now, right. obviously, that's different from commercials where, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, I feel like on a commercial job, Generally, it's no, you're hired to to make this look good right. versus you're here to collaborate with people. Mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a different approach, at least for me, when it comes to commercial yeah. work, you know. Well, when are we doing Mosquito Bites 2? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the real question, right? Like, that's the real question. Well, yeah. uh, me and David, you worked on, uh, we went to college together. So that's yeah. the really the key moment. Yeah, you yeah. shot my thesis and then you shot a bunch of other projects later yeah, on. Yeah, no, we had some we fun. Worked Quite a bunch of like we shot two music videos. We've shot yeah. uh, three like film projects. Yeah, uh, one on film even we did sixteen mil <laughs> yeah. project, which was fun. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, so you are more kind of like the old school guy. I remember one time I've uh, in terms of like gear and what you like to use. Yeah. I remember you calling uh, uh, like the DSLR or whatever mirrorless cameras like toys. You don't consider them like real things. Is that still? <laughs> Like, I remember you saying that at some point. You're like, you really, really like dismissed them. Like, ah, like ah, they're not real cameras. Yeah, you know, I was a. Uh, oh. I'm. I feel like I've mellowed out a lot since my uh, Brooklyn college days. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe in some ways, and maybe in other ways, not. You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember being a very ambitious uh, kid. You know, <laughs> not okay. to say I'm not ambitious now, but uh, yeah. I remember being very. Uh, as I would say, uh, I was hot, like hot blooded, maybe okay. overall, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I have different views on a lot of things since then. And uh, obviously working in the industry, I think, mellows you out a little bit. It tem- mm-hmm. Or maybe, like, teaches you some things about, like, how, how uh, what this industry is and how to how to navigate it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, as far as cameras go, I mean, I don't know. At this point, I think cameras are cameras. Like, I mean, it's whatever. You can shoot on whatever you want. I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've, but what do you think is like, uh, you know, there's this big uh, kind of transition period mm. in arts and media, the way yeah. we, you know, consume media. And maybe it's not even transition. Maybe it's just uh, change is happening just so fast. And we just keep changing and changing and changing. Like, you know, we live in a world where TikTok exists, right? Yeah. Like it's like the ultimate uh, social media like it almost like scrolls for you. Yeah. Like I feel like in some version of the app, it actually scrolls for you. Like the video just keeps changing. You yeah. Don't yeah. Have yeah. To no, go there, up. Yeah. I think there's like an automatic thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. You just yeah. Get or fed, maybe you, you just get you can fed, turn it off. You just or get something. fed content. Fed content. And yeah. if it doesn't trick you into like first second and a half. Yeah. You like yeah. next. Yeah. And uh, here's the thing with TikTok. I actually, you know, uh, I like use TikTok because I'm interested, fascinated with this uh, formula. If I see anything that's produced, like well produced, I scroll up. Scroll up. Hmm. Anything that looks like decent, yeah. I'm like not the not, not the <laughs> platform for that. Like I don't care for I don't care about it. Like anything that was put into any video that yeah, somebody yeah. put more time than they should have. Yeah, I'm like nope. Next. Well, it's uh, funny because I mean I mean I've half the time I feel like I'm shooting. They say they will do like a couple shots. We're like, hey, can you frame this up for TikTok? Yeah, you know, and it's like, all right, yeah, we'll put on the frame lines and just this, this little, we'll, we'll do like a little TikTok segment, right? You know, that for the using edits. Alexa, yeah, exactly for yeah. for the edit, you know, yeah. 
Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do that too. Like at my company, we shoot yeah. like we weekly like show and like a bunch of like stuff. And we always say we always frame like we have like a our host, the guy who kind of talks about you know yeah. Tylen Stone, and we frame him uh, where he would be seen in the IGTV format. Well, yeah. So we make sure we're always far enough where that would look good on YouTube, but it also would look good in uh whatever nine to sixteen, right? Sixteen to nine nine to sixteen. So yeah. basically yeah, for the sure. vertical format. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah. like the worst format ever. Like to <laughs> someone like me and you, yeah. it's like, you know, yeah, uh, it's 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 a it's, sin. It's <laughs> it's a really useless aspect ratio. Very useless aspect ratio. Like what what are you showing really? Like, what, you sense, don't yeah. show like what are you showing it, as far it, as creatively? Like it's yeah. Like, <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah. But this is the world we live in, and we yeah. have like a whole show that's yeah. all shot like edited like that. Yeah. And uh, but we have to be considerate, right, when we shoot. Yeah. But I guess my question is this, uh, or you know, the the conversation I want to yeah. uh, open is um, like how gear is so much more accessible and easy to use. It's all about light rigs, light uh, setups, one yeah. man job, right? Like a classic uh, cinematographer needs you know, a team of like five people at least. Or yeah. Like, right. So even like yeah. when we were doing our films, like yeah. at least two, three people extra, yeah. you always need it. And we're talking like small budget student films, yeah. you know? Um, and now it's all about one man job, including a drone. Like a yeah, person yeah, also yeah, does totally. the drone, right? Yeah. Like a little bag, yeah. carbon fiber <laughs> sticks. Like, yeah. um, and I always found that, I don't think it's in my opinion, but history shows us that comfort overcomes quality. Like hmm. I remember when, yeah. uh, not I remember. I remember the. I know the stories. My mom would tell me that when uh, ball pens, right, like the pens that we use now, came yeah. around, people were like, "Ah, they're not gonna stay because calligraphy is the art, cursive is the art, and ink yeah. and and the and the." Uh, and the pen with ink is the real deal. Yeah. What the fuck is ink? You know, it's a you know only yeah. something that exists in the thrift shop nowhere yeah, yeah, else, yeah, yeah, right? No, sure. And both yeah. pens are dying now because nobody's even writing anymore. People are typing, right? Yeah, totally. So the world they don't care about calligraphy. It's gonna stay, yeah. and maybe it'll come back for a couple of years, like vinyls yeah. came back or whatever. It's gonna be something trendy, but yeah. realistically, it's not an industry not anymore, useful, right? Yeah. And I feel like everything is like that, right? And like n- how many times like you see people go take pictures in the nature, really, you know, yeah. they use their phones. Yeah, like totally. the consumer phot- ph- ph- uh, like um photo camera yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Totally. The consumer photo camera is your phone. Yeah. yeah there's professional f- photo cameras, sure. Yeah, totally. But for professional shoots yeah. and how far is that's going to last? I-, I don't know neither. What's, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, for sure. So I, I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah. What do you think well, is going to happen? Well, it's a it's interesting that I mean, since you know, I don't think people actually know it, the digital camera in reality is a very new thing, and maybe more in particular in the world of cinema, like the uh, the right? Alexa, which was kind of like the first. I mean, you could argue the red one, but like Alexa was kind of like the first. The movies, big movies, were like, okay, this is a camera we can use. What was Alexa two thousand nine? Mm-hmm. Like uh, yeah, like two thousand something around there. But um, I mean, basically, like twenty eight days later was one of the first yeah. movies they shot in. Yeah, digital. no, and basically, only around two thousand ten did movies start using digital cameras, and a lot of people, and myself included, I just for some reason when I was watching movies as like a twelve year old, I didn't really think that they were using film. It just mm-hmm. didn't. It seemed like digital cameras were like a thing, like, right. but I, I didn't realize mean, that the yeah. whole industry was still using film. Yeah, all yeah, exclusively. Yeah. Like, um, they didn't, they just cleaned it up. Almost. Exactly. That yeah. The, yeah. The obviously. Thing. Yeah. The yeah. technology. I mean, the reason films look newer is because scanning processes have obviously right. gotten way better, and like the, the editing process has gotten way. I mean, obviously that's the reason movies look better. Right. But um, ultimately, it it was still all the film, the same film. But um, I guess when it comes to like, I guess obviously the prosumer tools consumer tools and all this thing. I, I don't think like the industry I mean the industry has changed immensely. At the highest level you can make an argument that not, maybe. I mean ultimately whether a big movie uses a digital camera or not, it doesn't change a lot. I mean, yeah, it changes the process of for a director, creatively maybe, but ultimately you still need the same amount of crew. You need the same amount of people. Like, you know, you can shoot more maybe. Yeah, maybe it's like you save money. 
doing some money streaming digitally, but ultimately it's not like the a big, a humongous shift for the big stuff. No, well, well you, I mean, what you were talking about is like, yeah, it has opened up a new window of like, yeah, now, um, like with TikTok, I can make content at home with uh, my phone. If I want to do, I don't know, upgrade and do a fancy podcast, I could have like a C100 or something. And yeah. then that's like for a podcast, that's like, all right, that's actually, you get high, uh, really high quality from that for like a podcast. Um, but as far as the work goes or transitioning, I don't think like the, this innovation is going to change things a lot because ultimately cinematography is hasn't changed Mm -hmm. i mean it it advances obviously there's new tools and people learn new ways of doing things but the process of shooting something isn't really changing Uh, like what what digital has done if if anything is yeah it's increased the quality of a lot of fields that didn't necessarily used to have the the highest amount of quality. like let's say like music videos right mm-hmm. in like the 90s you know 80s if you shot music videos it was it was not really like looked well upon like it was like mm-hmm. not like a bad but it was like oh this is kind of like shitty work like yeah, yeah, people yeah. oh you're trying to become a dp oh you're doing low-end work music videos like all music videos were like kind of like low-end even like the really nice ones were like all right this is like not amazing in the early 2000s even though, like I say, it was a different time, but music videos started gaining some popularity. And nowadays, I mean, you get music videos with million dollar budgets, you know, like and the quality. Obviously, the people hired and to do those are considered very accomplished cinematographer. I mean, honestly, did you get like movie cinematographer, like yeah. Joker's cinematographer and directors? Yeah, you get movie directors and cinematographers making music videos now. And um that's you know you could i know you could make an argument commercials yeah exactly you can make an argument that you know maybe the advent of the digital camera had a play in making this content much more receivable and then ultimately leading to oh and now big time directors and cinematographers and big names now that do movies step now into doing music some music video every once in a while or or a commercial but um in the way that like you were mentioning like the pen eventually like it over it like the pen overcame the, the love of calligraphy um i don't i don't really see that happening in the in the film industry because mm-hmm. like ultimately there's a place for what everyone does mm-hmm. like like i like i don't know like saying i shoot when i shoot some yeah I've, I've shot tons of things with a variety of different level of crews or different size of crews but as it is i mean personally right now i don't really shoot something that doesn't have crew I just, I'm not interested in doing it and I don't really need to. Like, I need at least the first, I need a second, I need a gaff, I need a key. I need certain things to shoot this project now, you know? And that's just yeah. the point of, that's the level I am in my career where I, I just need certain things to make a project work. And, you know, that's, I guess, maybe a step towards more like what you would call, I guess, classic cinematography. And yes. obviously people make cool stuff by themselves, you know? I mean, I'm pretty sure someone out there's made a cool music video on like a C100 by himself shooting. It probably looks amazing. But I think it's, just, it's different things. Like it's different fields almost. Like not not, not even different fields. What, I think what the, I want to say is just like, it, I don't think they're infringing upon each other. Mm-hmm. I think they exist in separate okay, I see what ways. You mean, like yeah. they don't, they don't change. Like I think, I don't here's think the budgets, thing. I don't think the budgets have gotten lower for but a certain things. He, you know? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. There's, I think, where it could overlap, right? Yeah. And more and more young guys, uh, there's so many, like, YouTuber kind of uh, videographers, right? The yeah. big guys, like Peter McKinnon. I don't know if you know any of these guys. Mm, like, uh, I'm not too Parker familiar, Welbeck. Like, like, millions and millions of subscribers. These guys who just, you know, shoot with, you know, yeah. R5s. They shoot, like, insane stuff. Yeah. That you would be like, what? Like. Yeah, yeah, how totally. can you do that right yeah, no. they go they ride bikes they sit on the bikes and they would yeah. get on these roller skates or whatever and they get some crazy shots and they're you know uh that you cannot believe like they get access yeah. to these great locations uh great little you know um like um like i don't know effects and like this cool items that they get make commercials off and uh, uh they show here's the point these guys show the youngsters that you can do that with uh five thousand dollars in your pocket you can get a camera and everything you need small package and i'm thinking that in another five ten twenty years uh 
big rappers, big musicians who are also becoming less and less. Like, there's another thing that's happening. I feel like the stars are coming back to, on Earth are not stars anymore. I mean, they might stay for some more time, yeah. but you see we live in the world now where Matthew McConaughey created his YouTube channel and literally yeah. posts like, hey, welcome to my YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like stars kind of coming yeah. to Earth now. And uh, there's a lot of smaller artists, smaller, yeah. you know, uh, stars yeah. who have following totally. like millions of people, yeah. but nobody knows about them because it's not Madonna's, right? Yeah, it's yeah, like there's sure. so much more sub uh, c- kind of cultures and sub artists. Yeah. Um, and they will be hiring these uh, kids who are now like 20 and learning all this stuff. And they're going to be in, in 10 years, they'll do everything by themselves. And they will be competition of the people that you're talking about. Say, and I, you're going to see, uh, you're not going to see people where that say, oh, we have a crew. They'll only be hiring. You know how like editors, like it yeah. happened to editors. What yeah. I'm talking about, it happened to editors. Yeah. Because like my prof- a lot of my professors throughout my like old school guys who've yeah. done like big work on big films, they don't know how to use any of the uh, of yeah. this stuff. Assistant editor sets it up for them and they do they use the the, the app, but they don't know Codex, they don't know ProRes yeah. or what the difference between Rex seven oh nine and uh, you know this kind of LUT or yeah yeah uh, co- like all of, none of that. They don't they can barely know how to use the software. Yeah. But they know how to cut the movie, right? Yeah. Nowadays, you cannot get a job as an editor if you don't know Photoshop, Illustrator, no, this, know. that, yeah, that. So, so you are a one man job, and you not that's it. And you also could be a videographer. Can you also shoot? Yeah. Great, that's a plus. Like yeah, yeah. that's the kind of you know uh, totally. jobs that editors have become. Yeah, graphics, all of that shit. Yeah. You have to know. Well, yeah. So uh, I'm thinking if that's gonna ever infringe, you know, into your profession. I, I don't I don't I don't think so. Uh, I I think um. So, this is the way I've seen it, I guess. With so let's say this twenty year old kid that makes this amazing things with his, like you know R five. Let's say mm-hmm. like, he makes some amazing con, makes amazing videos. What ha, what skill does this kid have? He's probably you has a very good creative eye, very good creative vision, probably more along the lines of being a good director. Right now, and this is the part where I think it gets kind of interesting because a, a lot of these, what I would say, I guess, videographers that do these, like you were mentioning, do very good, interesting videos and all stuff. More so than cinematography, to me, what they do is more in line with directing. You know, I, I guess in the traditional sense, cinematographer is a person that looks for maybe traditionally, of course, today it's changed, but like traditionally, much more a technician that uh, f- maybe feeds upon the creativity of the director and can add and build into that, but the lead being the director. I find that these videographers, more of what they do is more in line with directing as far as they are the creative force. They know what they want to see, they cut it, and they have a vision. And when I, what I've seen from people that have started doing that and then move into the, like fully working in the field, that they do become directors. And more so that they change the industry in the sense of like they start doing all these single man jobs for big artists. No, the industry changes them because what their skill that they've made them do these good is their creative vision. That's what they have. And that can apply to big shoots as well. So when they're brought on to know, do the next Madonna video, they, you know, their creativity, they build this plan. And then, uh, you know, the label or their production company, whoever hired them says, all right, yeah, you have a hundred thousand dollars to do this. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take care of you though, so we're gonna get you a good cinematographer who's gonna help you do your vision. We're gonna get you these. We're basically we're gonna get you everything, and then your vision will come true. And the director then navigates it from there. You know, I, I don't think it. Um, I, I don't think the budgets go down. Like I said, ultimately the person, this person who's doing this, more like elevates, you know, mm-hmm. climbs the ladder per se, and then because what their talent is is their creativity, you know, and they. That is not limited to their tools that they use, you know. They're just, you know, they eventually just start using different tools. You know what I mean? So I, I don't, I don't think it gets to a point where, because ultimately, like yes, the quality barrier per se, like the, like back in the day, the, there was a like humongous quality barrier, right? Like if you weren't shooting with these big like thirty five mil cameras and shooting with a full crew, it's like all right, your quality of work was all yeah. the way down here. Now it is, of course, the gap's closed, mm-hmm. like. Ultimately, I was, of course, like, unless you're not going to be shooting movies, like, unless you're shooting, like, big movies, like, it's impossible for, like, a one-man person to make. 
I don't know, make some movie like The Joker. Of course, well, of course. There's, yes. a, there's a gap there. Of course, you need a, a tons of people to do something like that with tons of ex- years of experience. But I think that while that gap closes more and more, I think there's a limit to that gap as well. Like ultimately, if Coca-Cola wants to make a commercial, like just realistically, what type of commercial can they make that is one person with the uh, with the one camera? It's I don't, I just don't think there's a there's a world where that's a that's yeah. that's truly a thing. And like I think as far as artists go as well, like ultimately artists. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's obviously there's interesting like low budget. Like Billie Eilish just came out the video. I'm not even wrong. This was like a big cinematographer still and like a big crew, but the, the video was shot on an iPhone. Mm-hmm. Of course you still had like a big cinematographer, big director, like yeah, a whole, right. well, a whole bunch of very experienced people, but it was shot on an iPhone. The tool is, is like simple, you know? Um, but like I said, I don't think, I just don't think, I don't think that there's a world where like this, this, what you said, it's like this one person is able to do all these things. I, I just don't think the industry changes that much. I think more like the industry, the person elevates with the industry as they climb the industry. The person also gets used to bigger shoots, but they're because ultimately the skill, it's not like to say like, oh, I'm good at shooting with an R5. As in, no, if you're good at shooting, you're good at shooting, you know, mm-hmm. like it's, that's regardless of what you, sure, you know, if yeah. you're able to make an interesting video that millions of people love to watch is because you have a skill and that skill is not limited to a camera. That skill is, you know, it's your creativity. You know, it's your ability to put together images. Your ability to see what's what people want to see. You know, and that's that skill is, I think, what right is, what the skill that matters. Yeah. You know, I agree. I mean, I know what you're saying. I guess my uh, like guess is yeah. that uh, it's all about the producers and the people who uh, put a certain amount of money towards this, right? And yeah. In one moment, they can realize uh, that they don't have to put, you know, a hundred thousand dollar towards a music video where they're like, "Oh, like that kind of music video can be done for ten thousand if we just get a videographer instead." And I think that quality, and yeah, you might not get that kind of quality even, you know, yeah, with well, a good videographer. Well, it's funny that well, what you're saying is actually a reality, and in, in some ways, so mm-hmm. in particular. Um, there's this one rap artist, one very popular rapper, who currently is basically has like a, I guess you would call his personal video team, mm-hmm. right? Very popular celebrity artist. Don't get me wrong. He also does big videos with big directors and, you know, the mm-hmm. whole thing. But this guy has like a dedicated video team. You know, they have like their own name and stuff. And they do a lot of his videos. And a lot of, and they've done some of the videos for his biggest tracks, like mm-hmm. his most popular tracks. And yeah, they're good videos. Clearly, I don't get me wrong. From my perspective, clearly the, it was done with two guys with a camera and, you know, walking around inside of a, j- a private jet and I don't know, in Times Square. You know, like clearly it was the work of two people with a camera to, me, right. to my eye, you know. But this guy, uh, and don't get me wrong, like I said, the, this artist also obviously does big videos that are clearly the work of several people and like a ton of professionals. But yes, there is that does exist to a degree. And mm-hmm. yeah, this guy makes a lot of his videos for very low money, clearly with them. You know, it's because it's probably just two guys, you know, just, you know, with probably two guys with an Alexa Mini, you know, still high end camera, though. Like, right. but it, yeah, but ultimately it is just two guys making the cutting it, putting together the video and then they, they shoot, you know, and they edit it. And yeah, the videos get millions and millions of views because it's a very popular rapper. And so, yeah, that does exist actually currently, Mm -hmm. but still, like I said there, and yeah, ultimately maybe that video for this rapper gets the same amount of views as Dua Lipa's multi-million dollar music video. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe ultimately gets the views, the same views, but people still want to see that high-end content. You know, there's still like, I think ultimately a demand for seeing higher end content that doesn't quite go away because there's a limit there's are limitations to what you can do ultimately with a small group of people there's certain concepts that you can't do you know right, right, there's a right. cre- there is a creative limitation to budget ultimately you know yeah true. Yeah, you can still do really cool things with no money but there is there's levels there's there's limits to what you can do you have to be contained you have to have your ideas right. confined to a certain thing that doesn't mean that they can't be great but there is a limitation creatively like it's particularly in film there's a limit to how creative you can be on a budget yeah, you know yeah so. no that, that, that's a very good point i mean I, I i see what you're saying um 
yeah, I'm just curious what future like kind of brings uh, brings to us, and uh, this kind of uh, usually this um, in every other I would say like film is a very uh, it's a very social yeah uh, procedure right yeah, uh, yeah you need sure. a lot of people ultimately it's very difficult to do with a small crew you need crew yeah uh, like photographers keep going back to them uh, is not it's just one person you can just go and take a bunch of pictures and you can edit them themselves and that's kind of what's been happening you know that's the photographers they've been doing that even since yeah. film right yeah, it's like for they, sure. I mean unless you go to like these fashion big fashion right, shoots right, and then they course. have the their four assistants that right, are, you know right, bad, right. you know like but for example that's also what we're talking about it happened to music industry where all big studios big a lot of big studios are closing down opening a studio is just the worst business idea well, ever see, right yeah it's interesting yeah, yeah where you bring well music so the, this is the part i think where the gap is with film mm-hmm. it's that ultimately like to make a catchy beat or to make to lay down to like all these music producers that mm-hmm. make all these beats what tools do you really need to do the highest level of this? I mean, there, you don't need that no, much. Not and you can make still make the highest level of work. Maybe not technically as far as the quality. I don't know much about sound and music, but maybe it won't be the most refined in terms of quality. But I, I imagine that it's like it's not like you need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to make. No, ultimately, you just need to have a good ear and you need to make good beats. And then if you do enough of these and you get a lot of them, yeah, you easily become one of the top music producers. Yeah. The, the With film, mm-hmm. there's, like I said, there's a gap because I think ultimately with film and there's just budget is much more of a thing. Like, I don't know, you can't shoot a, a car crash yeah. without a stunt person, a car that's going to be crashed and like basically yeah, uh, yeah. thousands and no, thousands sure. of dollars right for this one thing versus music there is no situation where you need to do to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on this one specific track yeah you know there you can do the top thing you can make the top quality of work and the highest level of work without being part of a major studio you can just kind of have maybe even the top tools in your living room and just do it there. Like, I don't know. If you look a lot of, like, the rappers, like, how home videos, they all have, like, studios in their house. Yeah, exactly. You know? And they make a lot of their music that they have to put out in their house. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I remember seeing the Migos, and they are talking about how, yeah, they had, like, the whole recording studio in their house that they built out. And I imagine it wasn't... For them, obviously, with the money they make, it wasn't crazy to make that. And they make all of their music in there. Yeah, initially, you know? even, like, the whole idea of, like, recording an album... Yeah. Initially, the reason they did that is because studios were expensive. Yeah. So they would just rather, okay, we'll save money if we just shoot a bunch of songs, if we record a bunch of songs at the same time. Yeah. So it's just, it's that's all it was. It's just yeah. to mean means to save money because you yeah. go to the studio, weekend prices are cheaper or whatever. Like, you know, there's a bunch yeah. of those incentives. And uh, then albums started you know, they became more something of like a concept albums, right? That yeah. had like a beginning, middle and end. Totally, and they had yeah, a yeah. whole other thing. So you, you, they played with that formula. But a lot of people talk about the classic album, um, like era is kind of dead. Yeah. Like th- there's no need for albums anymore. Hmm. Like you can, and it's so easy to record a song. Uh, it's very similar to uh, snapping a picture and posting it on Instagram. Yeah. Like there was a Billie Eilish song. I think it was Billie Eilish where... She watched the movie Roma and she got inspired and she wrote a song and she posted it. Yeah. She literally released a song in a matter of like days because she yeah. got watched the fucking movie and it got inspired. Like, yeah, if you talk to Metallica or Madonna, she'll be like, well, I need a bigger reason to write a song. Yeah. I got to go through a breakup to write yeah, it. You know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just no, I'm sure. not going to waste because I'm going to spend money recording yeah. a song. I'm not going to waste just my simple inspiration of watching a movie. But yeah. now it's like, no, why not? I yeah. can afford that. I didn't spend any money doing it. I have. Yeah. I did it on my laptop or totally. my MacBook. You know. Yeah. So it's interesting that film. I I know. I see. You know. That's it. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. But film might be kind of you know the the fact that it's social and kind of. Well, you need I think crew, film. You need... I think it's film is one of those things where yeah, the more money you put into it. I mean, not to say of course you will get better, but there is like you need money to do certain things. Right. 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 Like. You know, Bill, for, Billy Eilish's music videos are amazing. Yeah, like great music videos. Yeah. But obviously, yeah. clearly, looking at them, very expensive music videos as well, and that's clear. 
from like from someone that works in the industry, you look at them like, okay, clearly all these things in this video are done by the top in the industry, top professionals in the industry with a whole bunch of people working together to do this. And I think it's like with, with, with video, you do see the effects of money clearly yeah. versus in music, not necessarily, you mm-hmm. know, like, can you put in more money into a track and make it better? I'm not, I'm not, I don't imagine you can really there's a limit right like no and plus we don't we're not listening to music in high exactly. high quality yeah right? no i mean we're listening to our radios and our yeah. and our earphones and our headphones and, and you know? uh, all the headphones are bluetooth headphones which yeah. is also lowers the quality right yeah. and everything's wireless uh and we're you know conditioned to that kind of yeah. to lower quality and it, it's it's not a, you know, as i said like comfort overcomes you know yeah no quality definitely. like um Everything is more simplified, right? Like yeah. I uh, recently, like YouTube uh, updated their app, and uh, now it says it doesn't say uh, when you pick your quality; it just says medium or low or high yeah. quality. I don't know if you saw that. Hmm. So th- they don't have; they don't want you b- to to be remembering what's 1080p, yeah. 720p, <laughs> 480p, 320p. Interesting. That's yeah. like it's just like, hey, why do we have that? It's just low, yeah, medium, I'm and high. high. So that's what you want to know. It's just, but everything is like that. Like, I feel like if you knew computers in, I grew up, you know, with Windows, like you had to know a lot to understand the formats. What's JPEG? What's this? Oh, what's yeah, that? Like no, there's not, not today. Not no. today. It's, it's everything just, gets simplified. So simplified. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, is it a good or bad thing or good, good or bad thing? I mean, maybe it was extra information that I never needed. But yeah. you felt a little smarter. You felt like, yeah. oh, I'm good at computers. Yeah. Now everybody could yeah. be good at computers. Does it open doors for everybody or does it make us dumber? Oh, well, yeah. But I mean, I, I, it's a bigger I guess, conversation. yeah, like no, deep, I mean, uh, deep totally thing. Yeah, for sure. But, but I think interesting. What, what's interesting also about that though is that like the top computer or the top, uh, let's say in the 70s, the top minds that built all these computer things, they didn't like, their jobs never became obsolete. In fact, their skills were just able to be employed in what the new yeah. thing is, which is what I guess what is what I was saying to what we were talking about before. It's like ultimately, people's skills in fields, and I go maybe maybe they there's have something. To adapt, yeah, right? people and people. But I also I find that skills people's skills are just usually multifaceted. Like, if you were amazing, I don't know. At, like, let's say. Um, I don't know. Again, I don't know much about computers in general, but I don't know if you were like one of the first people with, let's say, Apple that wrote their code for their user interface back in the 70s and 80s. Right. It's not like your job became obsolete at some point or, or whether the Windows or Linux or whatever. No, you you're you clearly have a skill and that skill is able to be applied to whatever direction or whatever path this this yeah. field is taking. Right. You know, and that same I was going to before, I think it's like people's skills are are applicable to other things yeah they adapt but it's also right. like their their skills are generally adaptable like if you're some if you're really good at something i don't know also i i feel like honestly with when it comes to like a lot of work or a lot of the corporate positions and other thing it's like ultimately if you have common sense and a hard work ethic mm-hmm. you can kind of do a lot of things yeah. you know like you can probably get a lot of different jobs and succeed if you have a good common sense and hard a hard work ethic you know i think it's like people's skills are just multifaceted in general mm-hmm. but um but yeah as far as like things getting simpler yeah everything's getting easier you know i mean cameras are getting easier i mean let's be real like i mean back in the day you were worried about exposure and you're like oh how's this gonna look or you have to worry about all these like all these yeah. technical things to make sure your image was look good and nowadays you know you kind of just and I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm like, well, I prefer it, man. I love a. Uh, yeah. I have my uh, my personal monitors. Like, uh, I have it when I shoot. I usually shoot with my all my gear. So I have like a Sony 17 inch OLED and a TV Logic 5.5 OLED, mm. and they're both calibrated. So honestly, um, yeah, when I'm looking at that image because of the calibration and because they're OLED, I'm like, all right, this is an image that is correct. So mm-hmm. I can look at this image and I know that when. You know, this is how it's going to look like. Obviously, they're going to color anyways, but I have full confidence now that the image I'm looking at on monitor is the correct image, right, and right, this right. is the this is the actual amount of exposure on everything. And I love that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's I just love that. Um, I mean, obviously, when I shoot film, which I do every once in a while, you know, it's a different approach. You have to. You shot thirty five at this point, or no, no, I haven't shot thirty five ever, but mm-hmm. a sixteen, a good amount now. Um, still waiting on the 35 job, but, um, 
But like with 16, it's like, yeah, obviously it's different. You know, you, you're with your spot meter, you're measuring everything out. You're so not to say that I dislike that, but I will say it is pretty easy to shoot with a digital, like an Alexa and have these monitors and like, all right, yeah, this yeah. is what it looks like. Yeah. This is uh there's no risk involved. Yeah, yeah. there's not risky. I'm, you know, I find myself maybe preoccupied with other things, other, other elements of the cinematography, but I'm not necessarily worried about the exposure when I'm looking at a monitor that I know is accurate. Right. You know? Right, so right, that's right. um that feels pretty good. And I remember like Deacon's talking about like does he like shooting film? And you would think like a guy like that is like he he I mean obviously years and years of shooting film and he was just like I don't really want to shoot film anymore. I kind of yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He said that he was like I, I kind of just want to shoot digital. It's yeah. it's easier. It's, it's uh, yeah, I like a real person, not pretentious. I like yeah. uh, listening to uh, Bill Friedkin, which is one of my favorite directors. Yeah, he talks. He's like fun to listen to, and he talks about. Um, he's very involved in the like, Blu-ray process of his movies. Yeah, adapting like his movies, going through scan to be on a Blu-ray. Yeah, and. Uh, like when uh, he has this joke where um, like Tarantino asks him to uh, for Exorcist Prince sometimes to show mm-hmm. in Tarantino's uh, yeah. theater. And uh, Friedkin's like, yeah, no problem. But as far as I don't have to go there and watch that crap. <laughs> so because Tarantino <laughs> yeah. only shows yeah. stuff in 35. Yeah. And then Friedkin's like, it looks terrible. He says, yeah. that's not what I intended when I thought of this movie. Yeah. I don't want these scratches. Yeah, and like, yeah. no, I, that's not so, what I saw when yeah. I thought of this idea. I hope that wasn't there. Yeah. That's an obstacle, a technolo- technological obstacle. I hate yeah. it. Yeah. So Blu-ray looks amazing. Digital looks great. Yeah. But why do we have to do all that? That's that's terrible. Yeah. That's it's never about that. He like ro- people romanticize this idea, romanticize this yeah. idea about shooting on film. It just has this texture or whatever. And I know it. I've 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 done it. I've you know yeah. I've went th- through that kind of stage. But the more and more you listen, like that's not what storytelling is. No. Storytelling is about just stories. And what's the most uh, pure, not pure, most clear way? For us to experience these stories where we connect to them like the most. Yeah. Is it, you know, uh, anamorphic lenses and Mm -hmm. like, you know, and I'm like 23 to um, uh, what's the aspect ratio? 23 to 9. 23 to 9. Yeah. um, 29 to 11, whatever. I've forgotten already. (laughs) Like, or uh, is it, you know, shooting in film and have all these scratches or what is it really? Yeah, no, uh, totally. I mean, you know, obviously you you get excited using toys. Right. I, I still right, get excited. Right. I mean, as much as I'm used to toys, I mean, listen, if I get hit up to do a job on Alexa 65, mm-hmm. I'm going to be very excited to, to play around with an Alexa 65, you know? Um, the first time I shot on the LF, I was uh, very excited. I was the mm-hmm. first time I used black wings, lenses. I was like, I was very excited. I was like, oh man, these are, these are right, awesome. Right. But, um, and, you know, but uh, it's like, you, you know, you are excited to be playing with all these big toys and I guess this. But I, I do think that ultimately it's like story has to trump everything, right? Like, yeah, just like when it comes to shooting 16 or film, I think there is a different creative process. I would think gener- because, because of the nature that like you're loading a magazine, you're shooting on film, you don't want to waste. You're actively wasting money if you shoot a lot. Yeah. Right. I think there is a different approach maybe for a director and a cinematographer. And I think it changes like the way the set runs. And you could make an argument that, yeah, you like shooting on film because you prefer the the method. But as far as the way things look purely on image. It's like cooking. Yeah. I mean. Think th- about it. I mean, listen, there was, you know, it, the, the truth I believe is that today and today, when you shoot 35 millimeters today, it does not look different from digital. Mm-hmm. Um. It's uh interesting. Uh, I forget Steve Yedlin, who uh, Steve Yedlin. He's a cinematographer. He shot like Knives Out, and uh, he's like also uh kind of like that was a film, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, he also shot uh, I think the the most recent, not the most recent Star Wars, the one before, but um. Right, right. Yeah, they, basically, who works with that with that director? Yeah, yeah. I, f- I forget his name, but um. Yeah, he also shot the Star Wars and yeah, Out. yeah. But um, yeah. So. He's like also kind of like a, a di- like a scientist when it comes to images, like digital versus film and cameras and stuff. And he has a very interesting site that mm-hmm. he posted. Like, and again, he's like very much he knows things about like color and like mm-hmm. 
and like pixel. I don't know. He knows way too much about this right, stuff. Right, he's right. like clearly he's like a <laughs> genius when it comes to like yeah. the the science of image mm-hmm. today. But um, he did this interesting project where he put together he put together side by side, uh, like a five D, an F sixty five, an Alexa, sixty five mil film, thirty five mil film, mm-hmm. and the red. He just did a whole bunch of different formats, and they all looked exactly the same. Jesus. And he said. Obviously, there's differences between these, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to like. But under these conditions, I've created the exact same image. And basically, he was like, if you can tell me you see something different between these, I would like you to prove it to me. Because and to me, there is no. And no, you look, they're, they're exactly the same yeah. image. Like, exactly the same image. 5D. Yeah. Like, and how yeah. many cameras was it? Yeah. Like, I mean, it was like five, five six cameras. Yeah. A 5D, a 65 an Alexa, 35 mil, 65 mil. Jeez. Remember. But, um. Yeah, and of course, I mean, ultimately, yes, there's different conditions and stuff. But it's like I said, under these conditions, though, that I've set up for this particular shot, it was like a shot of like so you really a woman the, in a light. changed the yeah. light a lot. Exactly. You yeah. know? Not even. I think he just, uh, I don't think he's like he changed the light a lot. Like, I think he set up a certain level of light right. with a certain, like, you know, contrast ratio and a certain frame. Mm-hmm. And then on this particular, under these conditions, mm-hmm. he obviously maybe a little bit of manipulation in post. Right. Um, but under these conditions, all the images looked exactly the same. And of course, I mean, not to say that a 5D is going to, you can point it somewhere with the same way Alexa no. and it's going to look, no, it's not going to look the same, you know, but under the conditions, I, I it, you it was the same image. And I truly believe that, you know, when it comes to 35 mil uh, today, with how clean 35 mil has gotten with the obviously modern scanning processes and like, it's there's you just can't look at something and really tell me that it's shot on film or shot digitally yeah like which one was the i mean this i mean i don't know like la la land for example like I don't, 35, who, right? yeah 35, like, who yeah. out there really seasons like oh yeah that was 35 yeah i mean, I I don't mean no, something I mean, don't, don't be wrong a lot of people say, swear yeah. they do a lot mm-hmm. of people swear they could tell the difference and i definitely see 16 oh yo, yo, no 16 yeah. for sure 16 actually does right look away. different yeah, yeah 16 is, is very and I, maybe that's why it's so popular now because it's more yeah. visible it's no got i think so embrace the yeah if you want to shoot something yeah. and have that look i think 16 probably yeah. embodies a look more than anything but 35 right. mil versus digital especially when both of them are going to like higher end post houses like big movies obviously yeah. do i don't think you can see the difference yeah. at all. It's, I mean, it's, I would it's, never like thought that Dark Knight and all those movies are a shot on. No, you no, they no just one looks so exactly crisp. I mean, Tenet, like Tenet, Tenet yeah. looks that's crazy crisp. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it could have probably been shot digital, and I don't think it would have made a difference. Yeah, I mean, I obviously so. Nolan, maybe his artistic process, he wants to always shoot film, but as far as the the result, it's like it could have yeah. probably been shot digitally. Now, of course, everyone will tell. A lot of people will say, like, no, no, you're Dave, you're wrong. Like, this is. And again, maybe there's an argument. They have an argument, probably, but it's like, for me. You're you're making some people upset now. Yeah. Now people would say, of course, (laughs) that no, you're wrong. But I mean, I don't know. And also for me, like, with this whole LF, I'm not sure you know, but recently, like, this Alexa, like, released like a mini LF. Mm -hmm. LF is kind of getting a push right now in the industry. LF being, meaning large format. But Mm -hmm. so. Basically meaning a, a larger sensor size than Super 35, which mm-hmm. has been the norm for digital cameras for the past, since, like since digital cameras started. Like Alexa's have all Super 35 sensors, all the major cameras up until now. Would it be like so, like full frame, like on these cameras? It's, a pro, cameras? it's approaching full frame. Right. Um, so it's not But uh, yeah, it's, I mean... I mean, it's not yeah. the, uh, between 35 mil and full frame. It's not a it's big... A, yeah, it's uh, the same. Actually, it's, it's the, the same, same thing. Yeah, it's yeah. the same thing. I mean, for example, like the like that. Well, the five D is a full frame camera, for example, right? right? right, right. And the, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's the LF is like the new thing. Venice has like a I guess an LF sensor, mm-hmm. like a larger sensor size. And along with this, there needs to be new lenses because the lenses that have existed right, up until now, course. like yes. Cooks, yeah. uh, Ultra Primes, whatever, they do not cover. Yeah. Right. So there's newer lenses now. There's Cook S five, which is like a full frame version of the cooks and there's like the sigma line like the sigma cine primes i believe they're called they cover full frame and black wings and Mm -hmm. basically a whole like a whole new market for lf and it's more money to spend more well the thing is it's like people swear so and this one i could probably get a lot of controversy over but Mm. people swear that there's a difference right now there is a difference obviously with a bigger sensor you get a shallower depth of shallower depth of field Mm -hmm. right and yes, if you put on a 25 mil on a Super 35 or 25 mil on a 
yeah. a larger sensor, it's, it's you see more. Bigger, you see yeah. it's wider. It's actually looking more like on a Super 35 would be an 18 maybe. It's a wider image. So people will say that. So the let's say when you throw on, you know that there's a different it's effect. It's really a crop. Yeah. It's, it's not a really like 18. Well, that's the thing. 18. It's ultimately it is a crop but people will argue that it's not so yeah. for example the belief is that you know when you shoot it st- close up let's say let's say you shoot a face on a 25 mil a 50 mil a 75 mil yeah. 100 mil. you know it looks different Correct. every single Correct. lens because yes. the compression different, of yeah, things yeah, yeah. so course, people say that well on lf you uh can shoot a wide shot on a 32 and you won't get the same compression of the image because on a Super 35 camera, you'll have to shoot on a 25, and the 25 distorts more than the 32. Okay. Right. So you you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, let's say 32 on the LF and fifth and 25 for a wide shot, right? Mm-hmm. Same image, except there's the belief that since the 25 is a wider lens and in theory a wider lens distorts more, the Super 35's image will be more distorted versus the LF's image because it's on a 32. Right. A lot mm-hmm. of people. I I just I I, I it's not true. Like people, yeah, that's weird. People who try to, I mean, I see the logic. It sounds mm-hmm. logical that, yeah, obviously, 50 mil close up on a Super 35, you could shoot that close up in theory on a, I don't know, on a 40 or no, let's say you want, if you want the equivalent image, you'll shoot on a longer, like a 60 or a 75 on the, on the LF. But the belief that using a wider lens distorts more or to the, to the degree of like that it changes. I would say like basically the image is different because you're using like a 32 mil versus a 25 mil. It's just not correct. Yeah. I feel like every lens is like 50 mil is 50 mil. That's it. That's what it's going to give you. Well, not exactly. No, like, Uh, well, no, but like you just have to stand further away to get that, you know, but, but, but the most important, the reason I would use 50 mil is not to get always closer to the subject, but to give you, what that lens gives you like like exactly you know but the but the belief of the lf is that the lens gives you different things right so like for example it's not just the for for example yeah on super 16 a super 16 for example uh if you want to shoot a wide shot you'll probably put on like a a 16 mil or a 14 mil or something Mm -hmm. wide because obviously the image sensor is much smaller right so you need wider and wider lenses sure right yes um but there's this again. There's this belief that between Super 35 and LF, again, that so the 50 mil that you have, and most people, and myself included, when I think of 50 mil, I think of it does this. But it's based on Super 35 because most of my career has right. been with Super right. 35 cameras. So right. when I think of what a 50 gives, I think of a certain image Super, size. But that's right. based on Super specifically, right. like probably Alexa Super 35, because I'm so used to that. Obviously, when you go do with the LF, it's, it's be different. Wider, you, you, yeah. So I, I, but I know it. So I'm constantly it's no. Like it's wider. It's wider. Yeah. Exactly. It's wide. Fifty mil is actually wider. Yeah. But again, so the belief is that though. But since you're using longer lenses on LF, that it's less distortion mm-hmm. because in theory, the wider lens you get, the more distorted. Like as far as like rounding yeah, 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 the image, right? right? right, right. Um, so basically, uh, people say that on LF, it's less distortion. Yeah. Right. Because you could shoot wides on like a 35 instead of a 25, which a 25 distorts more than 35 in theory. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just not true. And a couple cinematographers have like done comparisons and say it this is not true. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'm yeah. not 100 percent sure. Like yeah. I would, you know, have to like. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, the, yeah, listen, I, 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 I'm of the belief it, yeah. that it's it's just not true. Like right, it's right, right. they look. I don't think LF provides anything to the industry mm-hmm. except to being more inconvenient as far as <laughs> as far as getting rid of all the lenses that exist like cook s4s or like them, yeah. super speeds or right all these lenses that now like cook pancros that basically can't be used with lf well there might be like some adapters or whatever but well would... no it, yeah you can't uh, you can't right. adapt it because it's it's it comes down to sensor coverage. yeah right yeah. right you can't right you it's can't you can't be, make the back yeah. end of the lens bigger yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, it, you can put it on but it's not going to give you the exactly LF, you're gonna uh, you're, you're gonna see well, you can put it on but you're gonna see like a little rounded right. black yeah, circle it's right, just right, it doesn't right, cover yeah. the sensor yeah, you know yeah, yeah yeah so yeah i mean that's that's definitely the game you know yeah i mean like i said but a lot of people swear by lf 
Mm-hmm. It's just uh, I don't think LF is actually the future. I think it's a. I think that's a fad. But uh, also, I may be proven wrong. Oh, you yeah. know. Also, I'm committed to Super Thirty Five. I just bought some Super Thirty Five lenses. Lenses? Actually. Oh, really? Yeah, I bought Look a set of. You. I bought a set of Cook Pancros. Oh. Yeah. It just came in yesterday. So I, I never thought you would buy lenses. You are you change uh, you know? every every, <laughs> every six months I meet you and you're well, like I, I I was so resistant to buy I can't lenses. wait till you buy your R five and start shooting. <laughs> <laughs> I was so resistant to lenses for so long because the thing is I have a problem, Zeke. The problem is that I, I just keep buying gear. Oh god. And uh I haven't I completed the camera package right before COVID, right? As mm-hmm. far as like Tripod, tripod, just, camera, yeah. monitors, wireless, easy rig. You know, I basically completed the package. Filters, map box, you know. And then you had nothing but else then, to buy. But then, essentially. <laughs> and then, I've always resisted lenses because lenses are unique to jobs. Yeah, exactly. You know, they, you That's might, what I always thought. Like, exactly. They I are, agreed. You told me that. Yeah, and I was like, not yeah, every, not, like, I'm not going to use these cooks on every job. Yeah. So I was, I always thought, I don't need to buy lenses and stuff. But um, I was talking to a good friend of mine who she's a, she's an AC and um, I don't know, we were talking about stuff and like lately I, I just use the cook pan curls a lot lately because I just, I just prefer them now. They're not right for every job, but for a lot of jobs, I do think they're right. And I just, mm-hmm. and it comes to a, a commercial, again, obviously doing a lot of commercial work, a lot of commercial work. I'm like, I just default sometimes to these mm-hmm. lenses. So I rent them all the time. And I thought, she was like, you rent these like every job I've done with you. So like, why don't you just buy them? And I was like how much do they cost and uh yeah i actually ended up uh <laughs> how much are they uh the set cost me 60 60 yeah so oh yeah um how many cost five six six lenses six lenses yeah 18 25 32 50 75 and 100 jesus yeah and uh so obviously buying gear at this point for me is purely a financial decision right it doesn't add to my career. Like, I'm not getting more jobs because I have these lenses now. Mm-hmm. Well, that was may have been true in earlier when I had a, when I bought a camera. Like, oh, he has an Alexa Mini. Let's hire him. That uh, I've d- definitely gotten to a point where that doesn't make a difference now, whether mm-hmm. I own a camera or not. It's just about money. So on the level of money, I thought, okay, these lenses are going to last, in my mind, at least 15 years. If I rent them out for a certain amount. I, I figure, I think when I did the math, it's like I ultimately have to... I think I have to do like, how many rentals? It was basically like, I need to do like 80 rentals to to, to make the money back. back. And I was like, in 10 years, I can do 80 rentals. I'm pretty Mm -hmm. sure. You know, so financially, I was like, this this might just make sense. You know, obviously, I'm not going to put them on every job, Mm -hmm. but I'll rent them. And I think 80 rentals on jobs, whether I work on them or not, it's pretty easy to. So how much you rent them for like a weekend? Uh, so we can be like a single day. I, don't, I mean, obviously, like again, I, it really comes down. If it's my friend, and it's, I, I don't care, like whatever, give me a hundred bucks, sure, you know. <laughs> but like, I think uh, I was gonna start renting them probably around like one fifty each a day, mm-hmm. maybe okay. one to maybe one twenty five. So yeah, yeah, for yeah. if you want, of course, you don't necessarily want all six, but right, um, right, right, right. You know, you want four of them, three. That's of them. cool though. I but, mean, um, good for you. For yeah. It. In theory, if you want the full set, probably like what is that gonna be like seven fifty something ish. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But for a day, so for a weekend, seven fifty. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, it's um, it's a, it feels good to have lenses, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, now you can just. Start I mean, making well, YouTube videos yeah. I mean, Alexa. you know, it's funny. I, I was like, I had like a little bit of a mini celebration yesterday because uh, I remember when I started at Brooklyn College, I had the small little. It was not like I mean, obviously, I just wanted to be a DP, but the other little small dream, like imagine a world where I own a complete complete package like lenses a camera wouldn't that be like amazing also i thought yeah i'll never do this this is a possible dream but um good for you man yeah no i did I'm it i was, I was very yeah. i was very uh happy to do it i mean obviously my goals have changed and evolved so now it's like not a not a huge deal i mean it doesn't actually advance my career at all at this point to own lenses but mm-hmm. it, uh, it, i did check off like a little personal goal that all right now i own an actual complete like i could do a shoot now and i wouldn't need to go to a rental house Mm-hmm. I just have everything myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's cool, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You can start uh, making your own movies. Here, here's yeah. the, the the thing I'm I'm waiting you to say. Yeah. There's one thing that you was always opposed. Yeah. I can't wait till you say that. Ready? 
What? Like, I decided to direct the movie. Oh, hell no. <laughs> I cannot direct. <laughs> You're always very opposed. Yeah. But I also remember you being opposed to being DP. You were like, I just want to be AC. Yeah, true. I remember. Yeah, I remember, I remember that, that as well. It seems like an eternity ago. But yeah, right. I remember wanting to be only an AC. And then I don't know at what point I wanted to DP. When are you going to start directing? I don't. I don't have any... I don't have any attachment to direct. I don't have any want to direct. So, I mean, th- I found, though, that as a cinematographer, for as you go along, you actually do direct a good mm-hmm. amount. Um, and I think every collaboration is different, but depending on director I'm working with, sometimes I'm my more creative input is warranted. I work with some directors that they are on, char- they are on top of it, and I'm more a traditional, mm-hmm. a traditional cinematographer in the sense of I just have to find technically how to make this image possible work with the production designer work with the mm-hmm. my crew gaffer keys acs and see see through this technically to get this director's vision and i've also worked with directors that are like hey how do you think this should look or like what do you think what do you think should be done here creatively and it's more like all right stepping a bit towards directing and of course there's times where i've actually had to direct like mm-hmm. um you know in certain situations director himself has to do something else and literally been told dave can you just like direct these next few shots mm-hmm. like yeah i direct them you know i set them up if there's an actor who's talked to the actors or models and had, so there is a level of directing in that now i think that's more than enough for me mm-hmm. i have no interest in seeing directing from beginning to end of building a concept and it sounds yeah. like a nightmare it's a nightmare to me but at the same time you know like so many of the big dps they direct commercials like Kaminsky directs big commercials. You know, he's asked yeah. to direct and DP them, you know, Interesting. and like a I lot of that. a lot of like Wally Pfister, who is now a purely a commercial director, but Nolan's ex old DP before uh, Hoytema. He uh, even during that time, he was asked to direct and DP commercials, big mm-hmm. commercial, like high end, like Super Bowl level commercials. Right. You know, and yeah, they direct. So it's like, yeah, because the, the, the belief is, of course, the DP is. I imagine if you're a DP for Spielberg, you do, you're not just a technician. You yeah. also probably have a high level of creativity, you know, a high level of vision, you know? So it's, it's in theory that, yeah, your vision can be applied to the commercial work and you're more than capable to direct a commercial. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe I can direct at the commercial level at a very shallow level, but <laughs> actually directing a, a narrative, but no, I can't. Mm-hmm. That's, I, I'd suffer too. I suffered enough making a thesis film. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't ever want to go back to that suffering. Yeah. Directing is the hardest job in the business. <laughs> uh, yeah. Honestly, like I want to be a director and no. it sounds like a nightmare to me. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, every yeah. time uh, something even yeah. remotely, even something small, I'm like, no. oh God, like this is a nightmare. Um, Before we uh completely go, before yeah. I let you go, I'm curious to know um, what's the best movie we've seen uh, past year? Past year? Well, I haven't seen that many movies, man. Honestly, I just... I'm a big movie. So I'm a big movie theater guy. Theory. Theater. Oh, theater. I I just... I really love to see the movie. Did you see anything in the theaters? Yeah, recently I've seen a a few movies. Not that many. Okay. Also, there's... I mean, there's there's some good movies out there right now. But, uh, well, I saw The Green Knight. Well, I had tickets... And yeah. we didn't go. Oh, what? Yeah. What happened? Well, we just went for dinner. And oh, the dinner, it was kind of, kind of too close. And yeah, we were yeah. like, you know what? We're, we're here with our friends. and Oh, yeah. Like, like whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, I, I, really, I really want to watch it because I love Ghost Story. That yeah. guy's earlier yeah. movie. It's excellent. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, How was Green Knight? I, uh... So, I've... I loved it. Okay. But I will say, people I saw it with said that they, it was a terrible movie. Really? <laughs> like, I mean, I found there's very poor, polarized opinions. I have another friend of Something mine. Something tells me that I'm going to love that movie. Just I looks, think I think you'll love it. Yeah. From what I, from what I know. It looks I, amazing to yeah, me. Like, no, I think you'll love it. Looks slow. Nothing is happening. It, like, exactly. I love it. Like, I, I, fucking, it's very slow. And honestly, not a lot of things. I mean, a lot happens. But at the same time, not a lot happens. It's definitely... I think there's a lot of the element of the Arturian legend of following this character on these mm-hmm. pretty, what apparently are like very random situations and that aren't necessarily that important. But I think that's, I mean, that's, that's what mm-hmm. I, what I like to see. Mm-hmm. And there are, I mean, there are some very deep moments in the movie as well. Mm-hmm. Not deep as far as like maybe building up to a grander structure as far as the film itself, but deep 
I think deep like philosophical thought right, in right, certain right, moments. Right. Very short moments are like, oh, there's a deep philosophical I mean, thought here. That's amazing. But also the movie is very cheeky as well. Like, and I, I mean, you'll see it, I think, and you'll understand what it means. Like, mm-hmm. it's very cheeky. It's aware of itself in some mm-hmm. degree uh, okay. of how of it's being silly, maybe. Mm-hmm. There's silly moments, and you know, in the movie, there's there's moments that you just, you just have to laugh because it's mm-hmm. it is silly, and I think it's intentionally silly. Okay, so it's not taking itself too seriously. No, the movie is but... not as seriously as you think it would take itself. Actually, I believe the movie does not take itself very seriously at all. Mm-hmm. Like there is a lot of moments that you're it's like, common. Uh, that's yeah, a, yeah. That's a, I feel like filmmakers, uh, in my opinion, good filmmakers uh, produce like high art. Yeah. But they themselves don't like high art, if you yeah. know what I mean. No, like I know, they're kind yeah. of very cynical about it. Yet they, before they do it, they're like, "Hey, I'm an idiot." Yeah. But here's what I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> like there's a little bit of that happening. Uh, I want to bring up a film that really uh, knocked me off my shoes. What's the American expression? <laughs> uh, knocks, <laughs> like, knock me off my socks. socks oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, the father, I think, is one or father, whatever. Yeah. Uh, the father. I don't know if there's the before. See, see, I wasn't it's, that interested in seeing it. I haven't seen it. <laughs> it I wasn't. Uh, but uh, my that same colleague, my friend, uh, 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 who worked on all those things, he's in yeah. SAG actually randomly yeah. because he used to live in LA uh, for see, ten yeah. years. So he has the screeners. He, he has screeners. Yeah. So he gave me screeners. So I just watched it. Uh, and. Uh, I thought it's like incredible. Really? It's, it's, uh, n- you never seen anything like that before, unless there's some obscure movie that's done yeah. that. But it's a movie where you see, uh, it's this man has uh, Alzheimer's. Yeah. But you see the movie from his perspective. Hmm. Interesting. So you never see it. It's not about, like, it, I would never guess to make that as a director. I would be like, well, we have to tell the story through the eyes of his closed ones, right? Yeah. So we see there. How, how what it is to be yeah. with someone who have a father who has Alzheimer's? Yeah. No, the movie doesn't do it. Hmm. It's a, it's almost like a horror film. Really? Because you experience the Alzheimer's with him. You experience yeah. what that feels, and you have to really pay very close attention. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's shot nice and whatever. You know, uh, definitely Anthony Hopkins gives a performance of his life. I think he's he's never done anything yeah. like that. I think it's the best movie. He's uh, best best. I haven't seen every performance. Yeah, of yeah. His, he won. He won the Oscar for he that. He won the thing. Oscar, yeah. and everybody thought Chadwick Boseman would win, right? Uh, because it was like so obvious, and he passed away. You know, yeah. he was a great actor. He gave this amazing performance yeah, of the yeah, other yeah. movie. Totally forget the name, but uh, Remy. Right. Yeah, Remy I forget. Some, um, yeah, I forgot that. But movie. Uh, everybody was like, "Sure, he's gonna get." And Anthony Hopkins yeah. one. And I was like, "What?" You know, without seeing any movies, I was still confused. But I watched the film and I'm like, okay, that's the best role Anthony yeah. Hopkins has ever done. That's yeah. crazy. I highly recommend it. I that movie mm-hmm. just kind of stayed with me and I could relate. My grandma has gone through yeah. some similar things. Uh, you met my grandma, I think, actually. Yes, my, I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah, she yeah. went through some things like that, so it actually yeah. was very emotional to me. And I think a lot of people. It, it, she never had Alzheimer's, but she had a little like you experienced some of that confusion, uh, dementia part of like uh, you yeah. know. And it's just so bizarre and it gets, it's scary. It's scary. You're that's, like, the fuck? That's I'm so like, interesting. I, it's funny. because like oh, from the trailers I saw of it, it just, it didn't seem like an interesting movie to me. It, it just I seemed mean, like, I'm yeah. like, all right, this will probably have good performances. Yeah. And it'll pro- for me, it seemed like almost like, oh, this is a boilerplate, like Oscar nominated movie. Yeah. Like this is kind of like an average story. That's probably going to have Anthony Hopkins deliver a great performance, but not going to be a great movie. It's a very difficult movie to sell. I could see yeah. it, unless you spoil it. Exactly. So there's yeah, things yeah. that are going to happen in the film where yeah. once you once it, once it happens once, you're like, oh, what the fuck? Yeah. You can't put that in the trailer. Yeah. Then it's a spoiler. I see. You know, so yeah. that's why it's a movie that's going to surprise you a little bit. It's not trailers really don't do justice. And I don't know how any trailer would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just gotta pay attention. Yeah, it's not like the Green Knight where you put a trailer yeah. and you're like, "Wow, yeah, this, yeah, is, this is super yeah. interesting." Yeah. Like, <laughs> it sounds like a like Green Knight feels to me like uh, probably like a Denis Villeneuve movie. Yeah, where uh, his movies are, I love him. I think yeah. he's like one of the best filmmakers ever. I, yeah, I was a fan of him from the beginning, from like uh, when he made the Incendies, hmm. and he went to uh, uh, got a he went to the Oscars. 
Yeah. Um, and actually, Roger Deakins was a big fan of that movie. And he said, next year movie, if you do in America, I'll shoot it. And then yeah. they worked together a bunch of times. But anyway, um, but his movies are always this big concept, uh, you know, a lot of action, very interesting uh, trailers. And then the movies are like, wait, what? Like, like Sicario looked <laughs> yeah. like every action movie you've ever seen. Yeah. And exactly. then it's not an action movie, right? Yeah. Or the same with Arrival or you you, you, you name it. Like all well, the other films, they well, all look like very kind of big and epic. And you think there's going to be a lot of action and shitty stuff happening. Well, I, but I think this budget has gotten bigger. Maybe he's approaching that though now. I mean, with Blade Runner. And then now, of course, Dune. Dune looks I mean, incredible. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to watch Dune, obviously, but I'm, I actually think it might be a bad movie. Really? I, I don't have high hopes for it, better put. So I have never been failed. Like, I don't think we've had a bad movie from this guy. And I just have a lot of trust in him. Yeah. Like, he hasn't. I didn't love Blade Runner, movie. personally. I thought it was better than the original. So, really? Yeah. Wow. I think it's, it's <laughs> incredible. I think yeah. it's, it's, I think it's, I mean, listen, I think the original is great for the zeitgeist. I think mm-hmm. it was a lot, very innovative. Yeah. I think I don't think it has a great story. I think it's it has like it's it's not great. It has mm-hmm. very good ideas. Yeah. I think it has very interesting philosophical ideas that are also very new for the time. Yeah. We've so far like today we've explored all those ideas. There's a lot more literature written, a lot of more movies made on yeah. that topic. Uh but as a story and that's why there were so many different cuts of it because they didn't know what story to they wanted to tell. Him, yeah. Ridley Scott, you know, it's all over the place. Yeah. I think the new Blade Runner has very clear story. Whether you like it or not, yeah. uh, it's very solid. And it's it, it's very committed. It's a lot more clean. It's a very clean story. Hmm. The original one, is, it's is you mesmerized by all these visuals and you cannot believe that it was made in the 80s, 81, whatever. Yeah. You kind of like more, there's more of that than the actual story. And that's my problem with the original. I love, I love the original. I always have. But uh, after I saw the new one, I was like, all right, this is to yeah. me a way better movie. Like, mm, I see. You know, but that's, that's. Yeah, yeah no, of course. No, uh, so yeah. I might like Dune. Yeah, see, I mean, Dune, <laughs> might, Dune might be, Dune might be a bit. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely going to be the the biggest movie to come out. I mean, short of like uh, whatever. I, mean, I don't follow whatever superhero movie comes out, but whatever superhero movie. Aside yeah. from that, it's probably the biggest blockbuster film to come out in a while. Yeah. I watched the Suicide Squad. I thought that was great. Oh yeah, I've heard it's all good reviews for it. It's really good. Yeah, well, you know, on the plane, <laughs> I love when I see. Oh, I watched movie on the plane. I saw um, the most recent, I guess, Harley Quinn movie. Oh, I guess like Birds of Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it didn't look great. I didn't watch. Well, it. Well, uh, funnily, I thought at first it was much more interesting than I thought it would be mm. at first, and then it quickly fizzled out. <laughs> like, like, but I, I thought it was cool because I'm like, you know, the movie starts off what I think so well. And it creates like, well, yeah, I guess a lot of superhero movies are good at this. They create a lot of good questions and they start off very strong. Mm-hmm. The problem is that they never resolve these questions and ultimately devolves into, I think, superhero movies. Mm. I think people love superhero movies because, I mean, obviously they love it because they're big and they're superheroes and everything. But I think a one what attracts people initially is like, I think superhero movies are really great at setting up premises like these interesting premises but then they don't follow through because there's not much to follow through with you know yeah i don't, I cannot believe that that would be like setting up premises you can't really go far on that yeah no exactly yeah. I, I think yeah that's why it fizz, the birds of prey fizzled out right heavily because of that and i think it was such an interesting premise but then yeah there's there's not much to go through like ultimately yeah. the characters are not that deep there's not like a harder, there's not, there's, it doesn't go anywhere, you know? Yeah. Uh, what I say, would it say that uh, Suicide Squad achieves, which is, to me, is a huge achievement. Like one of the biggest critiques of like Marvel and all these superhero movies, the new era yeah. superhero movies, not the older Batmans and stuff. Yeah. Those are still outdoor films yeah. to me. Like they feel like Christopher Nolan, like Dark Knight feels like Christopher Nolan movie. Yeah. Uh, Marvel movies feel like Disney movies. They don't feel they don't have any voice. Yeah, right? they don't feel like they have directors. No, but Suicide Squad feels like a James Gunn movie, hmm. which is great. Yeah, it feels it ha- clearly is more than Guardians of the Galaxy, more hmm. than them. I see. Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. feel like James Gunn movies, yeah. but not as much as uh, Suicide Squad. And it was it was fantastic. Well, well it's, it's interesting. Pure yeah. joy. That's what you want to see. I, I'd imagine though, as a, as a, if you enjoy movies, you want to see a movie that feels like a director's movie. 
I mean, which is I like do. I don't. Yeah, I don't know who directed all the Avengers movies no, because they all feel the same. Yeah, because they're all like, okay, ultimately, I don't think a they're director... made by a committee of directors. Yeah, exactly. Committee of producers. Exactly. And execs. Well, and it's funny because even like because Chloe Zhao, who won yeah, this, right, she's directing the Eternals. New, the Eternals, so the right? Trailer, yes, they look kind of like. Yeah, trash. and I was like, is are we gonna see Chloe Zhao? direct this or is this yeah. actually just going to be another like i don't again and I, maybe i have to see the movie before i say anything but yeah i'm like obviously chloe Zhao got this because she won an oscar for no how like, many scenes has she really directed in it yeah like i mean how much stuff exactly is like how stuff, did she you know? did she have any word in the script did she have any creative like she won it for the oscar direct but listen when it comes to these big studio movies she's still a new director yeah like yeah. very new yeah, I cannot. Believe I can't it. imagine her walking into like a, a a Disney office and being like, "This is how this movie's gonna go." I I just, I mean, no. maybe, 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 but I, I can't picture so. it. There's you know? no way. You know, no like way. no way, no way. I, I mean, think the same with Black Widow. The director there, yeah, was this girl who made uh, small indie films before yeah. that. Not just they're almost like art house films. Exactly. Foreign. Yeah. Small films that are like very, uh, very indie. I would say yeah. that, like borderline pretentious. Yeah. Like how many scenes has she really directed in Black Widow? All that action she was like really giving thought like it's all second unit stuff. Yeah. Like 90% totally. of the movie is second unit. There's like five scenes between real people talking. Yeah. She directed those. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Like it's just it's I don't believe a word that comes out of Disney's Yeah, mouth. yeah, no. Like, I mean, but it's funny because it seems like, like Disney is picking up that oh, wouldn't it be cool to get like a cool director to yeah, that'll make us look kind of good. We'll do a cool That's director, it. but yeah. then they're like, but no, we don't want you to actually have an input, though. We kind of yeah. just want our, yeah. our movies yeah. have a rubric. Our movies succeed yeah. because of they follow this, like, I hate it so you know, much. like this uh, oh, yeah. outline, and we just want that. You which know, is interesting when, to see what Suicide Squad, you're saying, well, it feels like a director's it feels movie, like though. That, yeah, yeah. Which, is, which is what you want to see, I yeah. think, you know? Yeah. Um, the movie, and this might be a little controversial, but the last movie I saw before COVID was uh, Little Women, which I love. I love the original. Uh, the, I mean, there's so many original ones, but I love yeah. that story. I love it's the a, Christian yeah, Bale one. It's a great one. story. You know? Yeah, it's a great story. I, I love mean, the one. You from ask the yourself, 90s. right? Everyone wants to be a Joe. Yeah, right? exactly. Everyone, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. You know, do you marry for love or do you marry for money? Like, I, no, it's like I mean, everyone. Absolutely. Everyone loves I think little it's woman. a great How, story. How you not love it's woman, a great yeah. story. I love the original film uh, with Vinona Ryder and all those Susan Sarandon. You know, uh, it's like movie sits very dearly to me. Yeah. Uh, I watched the new one and I love, you know, what's the girl's name uh, who directed? Uh, she directed Lady Bird and. Yeah. Um, she was Gre in uh, Francis Greta. Uh, Greta, 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 Greta. Greta. What is it? Greta, Greta Gerwig? Gerwig. Yes. Yeah, Gerwig, Greta Gerwig. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Greta Gerwig. Uh, I liked Lady Bird. I really uh, uh, enjoy her in the Francis Ha, Noah Bamba movie. I love, yeah. you know, kind of her everything, like her yeah. vibe and everything. Uh, I don't believe they let her direct Lady Bird. I have the same opinion. Little Woman? I'm sorry. No. Lady, li, little Woman. I didn't like the movie. Little Woman didn't feel lot. like a Greta Gerwig movie to no. me. No. And that's my, my, and I'm pretty sure, and that's what bothers me is that these guys, these execs, are like, we're going to make a, the feminist movie in this time. We're going to remake Little Women, right? Yeah. It's a good time to remake it. We're going to give it yeah. to the Academy Award. I don't know if she won or nominated. I think she yeah. won for a Lady Bird, or best directing. Uh, we're the, gonna give this yeah. to an Academy Award nominee, or whatever winner. Well, yeah, the same thing with Disney. We're gonna make yeah. it look like it's the most feminist movie, and we're gonna give it to this girl. And I, I just do not believe that she, you know, made it that it was all in her hands. The same way, well, it doesn't feel like her uh, film. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think there's an element of obviously once you get a bigger budget, because I'm pretty sure I'm not. I don't know the exact number. But I'm pretty sure Little Woman had a lot more money than Lady Bird. Um, probably yeah know, and obviously had a lot more talent in it a lot more famous actors a lot i mean a lot more everything a lot more probably all and, around and significance you know? and a, to the zeitgeist that exactly. movie has that kind of weight yeah but ladybird is such a unique like it's such an i guess we, i mean maybe not the right way to describe but it's such an indie film mm -hmm. right it's such a unique film with a unique look and a unique taste and so peculiar and like and so interesting and I think just to see the stark contrast of Little Woman being like, Little Woman is uh, approaches much more of a studio movie. Like right, it's, right, right. It doesn't. I I personally did not really like Little Woman. The movie no, me neither. I, I it just doesn't feel like it takes 
risk. It kind of feels like it falls like a rubric of a studio movie. It kind of feels like, oh, this is the movie I saw in the trailer. And yeah, this yeah, is yeah. like, um, I probably could have just seen the trailer. And yeah. I, I understand what this movie is. Yeah, I guess know? I was trying to make example of... Uh, uh, a director not, yeah. Like what exactly what you described with the uh, exactly. Marvel movies. Yeah. But I guess here, this is kind of a Marvel movie. That's kind of what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, so. It's, it's actually it's quite interesting. big. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, who knows really, but... I mean, Little Woman had way more star. I mean, you had Timothy Chalamet, Florence Pugh, Cersei Ronan, like yeah, Bob yeah. Odenkirk shows up, and I was like, yeah, "Well, yeah, what yeah. is he doing in this movie?" And yeah. <laughs> for this for this role, like, um, yeah. you have so much more stars. And I mean, maybe yeah. I mean, I can't imagine maybe she got to direct. I mean, it's a period piece and stuff. It's yeah, like you know, a, yeah. I mean, I, I mostly I, think it's it's the movie's just important. It's too yeah. important to give it to Greta Ger- Gerwig, but that kind of for me defeats the purpose of making a fucking movie and get and hiring her as a director yeah and that's i i don't know what produce i'm just i'm putting words in their mouths but my point is like it's a, a bunch of people decided what what to do for her that's how i feel and the movie doesn't have any it feels like it was made by a committee well yeah again. i mean ultimately yeah as for the success she's had i guess ultimately though she is still a new director still like yeah, i mean sure. compare you you can't compare it to like I don't know, the Guillermo del Toro. Or like the well, don't of, give yeah. her this job. Yeah, give, exactly. give it to uh, the girl for Heart well, Locker. I, 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 Heart I, I, Locker I, lady. I, yeah, uh, Catherine, yeah, Catherine Catherine Bigelow. Bigelow like, yeah. Give it to her. Like, I mean, I cannot... I don't even think I'd want to uh, see sure. her. But, but you know I, what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, but you know what I mean. I think it'd be hilarious to see her direct yeah, little... Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Super spy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, no, but on that... I don't know. I do think that... I, I don't know. Like I think on paper, it's kind of like when you, we talk about soccer teams on paper. I, on yeah. paper, I like I love the idea of Greta Gerwig directing Little Woman. Yeah, I guess. So, I think yeah. if her directorial style probably could make a great Little Woman movie. I don't I agree with you. I don't think it came out in that movie. Right, right. But on paper, it seems like it. It it feels like the director is a good fit to me, yeah. and I feel like you know maybe giving more liberty able to do this. But it's like all right, if she's not gonna do it, then then who is? Like I mean. Ultimately, like, who is going to direct this movie then? Because it's not quite big enough to get, like, a big, big director. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. It's it's like Greta Gerwig seems to be, if anything, kind yeah. of like a logical choice. I guess. You know? I mean, listen, I don't know what other choices from the top of my head. I don't yeah, remember. No, for sure. They might have more. Yeah, um, there might be. There might be obviously more yeah. directors. But, like, I, what I do think, though, is that um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's also, like, she shouldn't have directed it because she wasn't big enough to maybe bully a studio around Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. i just think that i don't know i think that there's a there's a line that maybe this is also part of her career ultimately where i don't know maybe in 10 years of directing she's going to be able to really tell the studios like hey this is what i want to do and don't tell me what the fuck to do and i want to do it this way yeah i don't know know if she's doing anything else she's kind of like not doesn't seem like she's working a lot I don't know, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm sure she has something. What happened to Damien Chazelle? Has he been doing anything? He's got something coming up. Really? Right? It feels like he kind of, he was making so much. Yeah, every he was year. making so much. Well, you know, a lot of people didn't like First Man, I think. Yeah. I, I loved stuff. First Man. Really? Oh, man. I still didn't see it, yeah. It I weird. loved it, but a lot of people didn't like it. Wow. And again, it definitely didn't splash like La La Land. Mm. It commercially yeah. just did not have that success at all. Like n- remotely even close, so. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. no, I don't know. I mean, it's a interesting time for. Yeah, movies. I'm gonna watch Green Knight. You gotta watch Father. Highly recommend. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I have a screener if you want. Oh, yeah, I can for sure. Yeah, no, yeah? I'd love to. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Because those are like, I got a bunch. Like, yeah, totally. They're not like needed. Um, but yeah, man, dude, thank you so much for oh, coming, no, man. For, this was this me, was yeah. fun. I haven't yeah. talked to you, but I I think I satisfied all my niches about <laughs> gear and camera stuff. What's happening in the industry? Yeah, no, thanks You're for having me. You're one of the the best person I know who would tell me, you know, oh, what's please. what you yeah. see uh, about soccer. That yeah, was fun. like I'm like, yeah, I, listen, I I live here. Mm. I, I don't have well now more and more people watch soccer, but still, yeah, you know, it's difficult. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me, man. Oh, for sure. Really? Thanks, man. Maybe uh, you know, in a couple of years, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, no, a couple. I years, get no, bigger. No, you give me, give me a couple yeah, months. Yeah. I'll come back and talk. We'll, we'll, like, <laughs> we'll do. We'll do in a few months. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. Thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks, man. Thank yeah. you very much.